good morning friends uh welcome to this first edition of a series of very interesting webinars organized by the mumbai suburban orthopedic society which begins today this is a series of eight webinars which has been envisaged by the president of mumbai suburban orthopedic society dr ram prabhu uh, which uh, will be addressing very pertinent day to day issues in various aspects of orthopedics the first one of this series is uh, based on uh, some very day to day challenging upper limb problems this will be conducted conducted by dr pankaj ahire and a team of very prominent young young uh, hand surgeons from the suburbs of mumbai our first talk and our guest speaker for today is professor randy bindra who needs no introduction everybody in india and i'm sure all over the world is very well known very well versed with him is an authority on upper limb trauma and hand pankaj may i request you to introduce More sir and set the ball rolling More yeah very uh, pro young professor randy bindra uh, absolutely no introduction required in, in upper limb mumbai. circles i think he's one of the one of the most known names and uh, and uh, uh, we we would love to hear from him on 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 a topic uh, which is not very commonly spoken about and he is going to speak to us about facts and practices disorders of the hand uh, over to you uh, professor bindra thank you pankaj and satish and uh, good sunday morning to all my colleagues from uh, mumbai as you know i originally used to live there and trained at jj hospital with uh, professor tarapur wala so it's it's an absolute privilege to share a sunday morning uh, with you um so i was going to talk on some facts regarding factitious disorders of the hand and i will in the next 20 minutes or so kind of explain some of the common problems that we see in hand surgery where the patient creates a problem to get empathy and to get medical attention and not for financial gain so this is an unusual group of conditions which if you're not aware of you could easily get misled and end up operating on these patients So this is uh, where I uh, live now. So the Gold Coast is right here. We are in the on kind of midway between the east coast of Australia, and uh, we are on a very good latitude. So the weather here is always warm and sunny, as you can see in the picture behind from my balcony. Uh, as you know, most of Australia is in lockdown, especially Melbourne, and New South Wales border is very close to us. But right now. Uh, no australian can cross this border we can't go there and they can't come here so it's pretty strict uh, you have to quarantine if you leave the state of queensland you have to quarantine for 2 weeks when you come back so things are pretty tough gold coast is a beautiful city uh, we have 40 kilometers of beaches and uh, hopefully when everything clears up most of you will be able to come and visit we were planning to do a trauma meeting in june this year but it became a virtual meeting instead of a uh, face to face but hopefully we can do this next year in the summer again and have you over during your holidays in june now when you look at a hand as a hand surgeon it's interesting hi ram hi. good to see you how are you randy <laughs> good very good thank you good very good see you in the morning yeah not night of course so, <laughs> so when you look at somebody's hand you know once you get into hand surgery and i've been doing this for 25 30 years now you just look at a hand and you can tell what's going on right you can see muscle wasting you can see there's a burn there from his cigarette because the fingers are yellow so you know this person likely has severe carpal tunnel syndrome so the hand talks and with an organic disorder we have a pattern so if they have cubital tunnel syndrome they'll have numbness on the small finger they'll have tenderness at the elbow so they will have given pattern of symptoms they'll have recognizable signs and you and i can say i can make you better i can do an operation make you better so we call those organic disorders if you look at this young lady you can tell she's been traumatized cigarette burns on the back of her hand 
multiple self-harm, lacerations in the forearm. It's an unfortunate situation of depression, but she is not trying to hide it. You know, she's got a psychiatric problem and you know that she needs help. So she is not trying to hide it. The group of disorders I'm talking about are patients who create an illness, but they hide the fact that they are creating the illness. So they are trying to deceive the medical community, the doctors and the nurses. So as a group, we had organic disorders like carpal tunnel syndrome, wrist arthritis, non-organic conditions. There are problems that start without a specific pathology. So without anything, like there's nothing really wrong. There is no pathology going on, but it's related to a psychological issue. And here is... We'll take two cases and then I'll talk about the different conditions and we'll come back to these two cases to try to understand. So here's a lady and she came to my clinic, she's 34 and two months ago, she had cubital tunnel surgery. And after having cubital tunnel surgery, at that time her hand was normal. She's now come saying, my hand is stuck. I can't move my wrist. I can't move my fingers and my whole hand is numb and stiff. And you're thinking to yourself, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit in a neurological pattern. She's had ulnar nerve surgery from a surgeon who knows what he's doing. He couldn't have done anything wrong. So what's going on? Then you look at the surgeon's note, okay? Now this is the note from the surgeon and I've highlighted the facts here. So patient has subjective numbness. That means she's not really numb. She just says, I think I'm numb in that area. The physical signs were negative. Nerve conduction studies were normal. And he said here, I was not optimistic about the chance of success, right? So surgeon feels in his gut that this patient doesn't have a real problem. In spite of that, he operated because the patient insisted. Now that is where a lot of young surgeons will get caught out. The patient says, I want you to do an operation. I want to get better. And in your mind, you're thinking, nothing fits in. Something is wrong. Don't do the operation. The moment he did the operation, this is what happened to the patient. She became worse. Look at this other situation. This is a nurse. Now, the reason I stress here, nurse, is a lot of these conditions, a lot of these factitious disorders are present in either medical personnel or spouses of medical personnel. So a lot of these people have some knowledge of medicine. So they can manipulate the facts. They can create false symptoms and signs. So this nurse came to me saying, Dr. Bindra, I've got a wound here. This has been present for three weeks. I accidentally cut myself with a knife. I'm cleaning it myself. All I want you to do is give me a prescription of antibiotics because she needed a script for it, but I'll be managing myself. I don't need any care. It's gonna get better. And when you look at this wound, you got flexor sheath exposed, you got granulation. It doesn't look normal. So this patient, in converse to the previous one, actually has a problem, but she sees very nonchalant about it. She's not worried about it. And so you're wondering, this is not right. Anybody else with a wound with flexor tendon sheath exposed would be extremely anxious and worried about it. Now you would say, why have we got this uh, international hand surgeon giving me a lecture on psychiatry? And I'm not a psychiatrist by any means. The challenge is, most of these problems are much more common than you think. And whenever I give this lecture anywhere in the world, most surgeons immediately think, come to mind and say, you know what? I've had two people like this in the last six months. Now it kind of makes sense as to what's going on. So it's a much more common problem. The mistake is if you do surgery on them, they are then going to walk around defaming you in all of the suburbs of Mumbai. They'll go to all these other suburbs, meet all the, your other colleagues and say, Look at what this doctor has done to me. They've made my hand worse by operating on me. Although they are the ones who are begging you to do the operation in the first place. So that's where you have to be careful with these patients. Now, if you were to try to classify non-organic illnesses, there are two common times we see. So metaform, and this is like, you know, some people get a rash when they're under stress. Some people get irritable bowel syndrome, and some people get a conversion disorder or hysteria. You know, they fall down and say, oh, my leg is paralyzed. I can't walk, my leg is numb. We are familiar with those conditions. 
And of course, some people have aches and pains all over, and we call those fibromyalgia. And some people, of course, everybody has a little bit of hypochondriasis. And right now, I think we should be using this term rather than cancer. Everybody's worried. They've got this going on. Now, the unintentional disorders, uh, those were all unintentional. So all those conditions were unintentional. The patient doesn't try to create them. They think they have a problem. Now, factitious disorders are intentionally produced. So patient creates the problem on purpose. They will come to you with physical signs on purpose. They will read the book to know what symptoms and signs to make. So they will come to trick you. So it's an illness that is deliberately produced and is falsified for the sole purpose of being sick. They want to be a patient. They don't ever want to get better. They always want to be a patient. When you finish the treatment, they'll be angry with you. They'll make a fight with you. They'll go to the next guy and ask for another operation. So I had a patient who had 18 operations on the distal ulna, and he was angry because I refused him operation number 19. Now, if there is an external incentive, that means they're doing this to get some money or get time off work, etc. they're a malingerer. So these patients are not malingering. They're not looking for any gain other than your sympathy. How common is it? Well, some people estimate in medical clinics up to 10%, especially when you look at a condition such as pyrexia of unknown origin, almost 10% of those patients are doing things to themselves to raise the body temperature. So they're just, they're just lying and they're tricking the doctors. How much would it cost the hospital? Now in 1991, Grunert, and he's a He's a psychologist in one of the hand surgery units in America. And if you look at this, this is 20 years ago. At that time, the cost was 52,000. And why does it cost so much? Because this patient you know, comes to you with a sign, you're, you're like, this doesn't fit into it. I'm gonna have to get nerve conduction. That will be normal. You'll get ultrasound, you'll get MRI, you'll get CT scan, you'll get x-rays, you'll get second opinion, third opinion, neurology opinion. So they waste a lot of money. They affect their own health because they're spending a lot of time in the hospital. They affect the health of the treating staff because every time that patient comes to your clinic, you're like, not this, not this person again. I'm fed up with them. Why do they keep coming back? They keep coming back because they want you to do an operation. They want you to get involved with their care, which you are trying to avoid. They affect the health of genuine patients because they're sitting in a waiting room and they're saying to the patients, this doctor is no good. I've been coming here for one year. He can't figure out what's wrong with me. So your genuine patients start to get affected. And the problem is sometimes these patients will turn, they'll turn on you. They'll become your foe or your enemy and they'll decide to create a litigation. So they are just a problem case. And the best thing is not to get very involved in their treatment. I'm going to now show you some patterns of factitious disorder that you will see as a hand surgeon or even as an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, for example, one of the common ones in the knee clinic would be a locked meniscus, where the patient comes in with a locked meniscus, but they are always normal, and the knee gets straight after, uh, under anesthesia or after a few days. So we're gonna go through some common conditions. The most common is Munchausen syndrome. Now, of all the conditions that you will see with factitious disorder, most of them are common in female. Munchausen is more common in men. Munchausen patients, will create a problem for themselves. So they will create a wound, they will create a problem, they will bang their hand and create a problem, they will physically create a problem and come to you. So Munchausen patients will injure themselves. Named after Baron von Munchausen, he was a German soldier who would go around telling false, untrue stories and get a free drink from everybody. So these are, this is one of the common causes of factitious disorder, more common in men, Severe, they don't get better. When they finish with Mumbai orthopedic, uh, you know, when they finish seeing all the orthopedic surgeons in the suburbs of Mumbai, they'll go to the central Mumbai and see patients. When they finish there, they'll start seeing patients in Thane, then they'll go to Pune, but they'll keep finding doctors out of the region so that nobody knows their past history. They will do peregrination, which means that they will talk about something that's irrelevant. So when you say, how long has your wrist been hurting? Well, you know what? And they will do pseudologia fantastica. So they'll say, you know what? 
I'm, I'm a friend of Narendra Modi. He and I used to sell chai together, chai walas. We were chai walas together in, in, uh, in Delhi. And then when he became prime minister, I left and I came to Mumbai. But what about your wrist pain? Well, let me tell you, when I was selling chai, one day, you know, the chai was very hot and I dropped, but they will not come to the story. They will keep telling you some tall stories about how they know the chief minister, prime minister, your boss, the boss who trained you because they would have read about you and they would know where you're from. They know everything. And they come to you saying, all I want you to do is see this ganglion. I've got this ganglion. I want you to take it out. And you'll be like, it doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah, it hurts a lot. Does it affect? Absolutely. It stops me working. And they're begging for surgery. So you want to be very careful with these patients. Another group of patient is now the shaft syndrome patient. Okay. They are scared of creating a problem. So they will come to you and they will say, can you cut me on over here? Can you take this lump out for me? Take out my ganglion. Or they will say, my hand is numb. Can you do my carpal tunnel surgery? I've got carpal tunnel syndrome. And they will fake all these symptoms. They will come to you very sad. Nobody helps me. I went to see Dr. Prabhu. He said, no, you don't have a problem, but I think I have a real problem. He won't help me, but I know, you know, you have just returned, uh, Dr. Muta, you've just returned from England. So you're very smart. So you will know exactly, you will believe me and you will exactly know that I really have carpal tunnel syndrome and I want you to do my operation. When you finish the operation, now they're hostile. What have you done to me? You've destroyed my hand. Now my hand doesn't work. When I came to you, I could move my fingers. Now my hand is stuck like this. Why have you done it? And they're frustrating. They will not go away. And they're tenacious. They'll keep coming back to your clinic to ask for surgery. But they, they're not Munchausen, so they will never cut or hurt themselves. They will have the doctors do it for them. And they will deny the treatment. They'll be very aggressive uh, before they leave your clinic. So they're very manipulative. They'll come to you and say, I've been told you're the best. Nobody else knows what they're doing. You're my last chance. So if you start your practice and you're new, right? And somebody comes to you and says, I've heard all about you. You're the best doctor in Mumbai and you're the only one who can help me. Be suspicious. Don't start saying, oh, absolutely. I am the best. I'm going to do your operation. Don't get drawn into that scenario. When your operation is over, this is what they're going to do to you. They're going to be angry and they're going to complain about you to everybody and to all your patients around you. So here's that same scenario that we talked about in the beginning. So this lady had numbness in the little finger, told the doctor, I insist you do an operation, even though the doctor put in the notes, I don't think she needs an operation. I don't think she will get better. Her nerve conditions are normal. Well, then don't do the operation. Unfortunately, he did the operation. Now she's got this problem, which is completely factitious. And she's come to me saying, I need you to do a revision surgery on me and make my hand better. Clearly, she needs psychological help, not surgical help. Now, some people will come to you with a swollen hand or wrist. This will be unilateral. And these patients are interesting because they don't have pain. The hand is swollen. And you say, can you move your hand? Yeah, 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 I can do everything. But look at the swelling, doctor. The swelling is terrible. It's not going away. And when you, you take off their shirt and go all the way up to their shoulder, often you can see a cutoff where the swelling ends. And that's because they put a tourniquet on at night, make the hand swell up, and in the morning they come and show you. Now, obviously, you will have to do tests to make sure they don't have a venous thrombosis. So you can get a venogram or subclavian uh, vessels ultrasound. Okay. Now, in some people, if you're not sure whether they have some kind of a lymphatic obstruction, or lymph, lymphedema, or true lymphedema, you will have to do a lymphangiogram, and that is the one that will show you what's going on. You have to be very careful with anyone with a swollen arm and look for a tourniquet or something that creates that problem. So here is a man who came to see me, ex-policeman, and never gone back to work for 15 years because he had a DRUJ injury and had his DRUJ TFC repair. Ever since then, his hand is swollen. And he's like, my hand is so swollen, I can't do anything. And I'm like, do you wear a splint on your hand? And he takes out a splint from his bag and says, yeah, this is my splint. And so this fella wears the splint all night, makes his hand go tight. And in the morning, he complains to everybody that his hand is so swollen and he cannot work. So clearly, 
this is not a normal person. He's got a psychological disorder that needs to be addressed. This was a paper published by Dr. Smith in JBJS. And here you can see that this is a, this is a lymphangiogram. And in a lymphangiogram, you can tell where the tourniquet has been applied because that is the area where you get a broken window pane. So this is a normal lymphangiogram. This is like all broken lymphatics because they've been applying compression with the tourniquet right at this level. Here is an example from a dermatology journal where this girl has swelling of her right hand, correct? And what the doctors found was a little puncture mark here and she's left-handed. Remember, this will be on their non-dominant hand. So she was taking a syringe on the hand and injecting it. So when you see someone with a swollen hand, get an x-ray. When they did an x-ray on this girl, they found gas or air shadow in the soft tissues of the hand and she was self-injecting and giving herself hand swelling. Another condition you'll see in patients, and I see this very often in prison patients. So if you're in Mumbai, and if you see patients from Arthur Road Jail, I know in JJ, we see them, <laughs> they will hit their hand on the cell of the jail, on the walls, and give themselves a thickening and swelling, so they get a day out to come to JJ Hospital or wherever, and they come to the hospital and they sit in the clinic and they scare all the other old ladies sitting over there. And Secretan, who first wrote this paper in 1901, found this in coal workers. And the coal workers who wanted to get out of work would bang their hands in the coal mines and say, my hand is swollen and I can't work. Now, when you look at these patients, they have hemosiderin deposition in the skin. And that's because they've been hitting it. They're getting little bleeds. So the skin color is different besides the swelling. And the swelling is not like a soft tissue swelling. You can actually feel a mass around the extensive tendons. And of course, the best way to diagnose it is with MRI or with an ultrasound. Now here is someone with secretan syndrome. Now this is uh, from one of my mentors, uh, Professor Burke. So Professor Burke, this is one of his patients and his slide. And he shows how this patient had this thing and they thought it was like a rheumatoid. And when they operated on it, all they got was nondescript scar tissue. So it's not soft synovial tissue. It's a thick white, it almost looks like Dupuytren's tissue because there's just type three collagen, just scar tissue from repeatedly uh, banging the hand on the wall. A common condition you will see, again, is patients with non-healing ulcers. Sometimes it'll start, they'll say, I don't know how it started or a small injury or a mosquito bite or a spider bite. And sometimes they will have had an operation like a ganglion or a carpal tunnel. So somebody, something a surgeon did and they will pretend to be a surgical infection. They're otherwise quite healthy, but they will tell you the wound has not been getting better for weeks and months, which does not make sense. Now they say, we want the wound to get better, but you're wondering why it's not getting better in spite of all the treatment you're doing. Now, Dennis Phillips wrote a nice clever paper on how you can do this tetracycline fluorescein testing. The trick with this is you put some tetracycline on the wound, right? You tell the patient this is magic cream. If it is on your hand for 24 hours, by tomorrow morning, your wound is going to be healed. So you have to come to my clinic tomorrow morning. But don't touch the dressing because the magic will be gone. Now, the patient is going to go home. They're going to take out all that, wipe it off, and rewrap it very carefully so it looks undisturbed. And when they come to you the next day, the dressing will be non-touched. You'll say, did you touch it? No, I didn't. Okay. And then when you look at their other hand and you do fluorescence, like a UV light, you'll see they've got all the fluorescence on the other hand. That means they've opened the dressing and they've touched the dressing and rewrapped it up. So you can pick them up as they are interfering with the wound healing. Here is a patient. Again, this is a patient of Professor Burke. Patient kept coming back to clinic with a small wound. And we are doing little biopsies and all kinds of things to figure out, is it a squamous cell carcinoma? What is it? Finally, someone said, let's do an X-ray. And the patient has been shoving in paper clips and all kinds of wires into his hand. And even though we took it out, he came back repeatedly with more and more stuff in there. So you can't really help these people. They have a serious psychological problem. This was that nurse who came to me. So I said to her, to make your wound heal, I'm going to have to put you into a cast. Now, this is the thing where they will definitely resist it. They will come to you saying, 
the cast is tight, I'm claustrophobic, they'll keep fighting you to try to get the wound to heal. And you have to kind of confront them in a good way and say, look, I know this is a problem for you. I know there's some stress going on in your life. I'm going to get you some psychological help, but I have to put you in a cast. Otherwise you can go and see another doctor. The only way I can treat you is in a cast. So in the end, we put this Integra, which is an artificial dermal matrix. We did not graft it. You don't want to do a complex operation. If you do a skin graft, they will then, if you take a skin graft from here or here, you've given them a new wound. So now they have two wounds that will not heal. So try to avoid creating an extra surgical wound. So we put the Integra on, put her in a cast, and we were. she was not allowed to disturb the cast. We would take out the cast in the clinic. This is by six weeks, and this is eventually by about three months, this had fully healed, but we always kept her, this part of hand wrapped up in a cast so she couldn't interfere with it. The last type of disorder that you will see with these patients is clenched fist syndrome. And these patients come to you with their hands clenched, but they have these fingers open. So they can do everything, but when you ask them to open these fingers, they say, I can't. When you go to open it, they have paradoxical stiffness. That means while you're talking to them and discussing, they'll relax. And the moment they know that you open it, they'll quickly go right back. When you give them anesthesia, they'll be open. The moment they wake up, it goes back in flexion. So the key with these patients is if you do give them an anesthetic, give them a regional block so they can't squeeze it in anymore voluntarily. Open it, make sure they're awake so they can see that it's open. Because if you do under GA, when they wake up, they'll pull it down again. So you will not be able to let them know that you're aware this is a factitious disorder. And here is a similar lady. Of course, in the, in the Western world, Dupuytrons is quite common. So we have to make sure they don't have Dupuytrons disease. Sometimes you will see elderly patients with dementia with this thing, and that's just a primitive kind of withdrawal reflex. That is not the clenched fist syndrome, but this is a common condition. It's funny, when I sent this patient to the uh, psychiatrist, he said to me, this is a hand surgery problem. And then I had to send him the reference article called the clenched fist syndrome and said, no, this is a psychiatric problem and you need to be treating this. So it's funny, even psychiatrists are not aware. Now, here is a patient of mine from one month ago. He's had an injury to the ring finger, right? So it's a little bruised. But you look at his hand. He's got dystonic posturing. I'm putting his hand down, and he pulls it. You ask him to make a fist, and he's doing this funny motion where, see this? He's got spasms. His hand is trembling. We did plain x-rays. They're normal. We did MRI scan, normal. We did ultrasound testing to see if the pulley was ruptured. Nothing wrong with him. He's one month from surgery. You can see his hand here. He's not washing it. It's all dirty. He's completely gone into a psychological problem, and he's developed dystonic posturing, a type of clenched fist syndrome. And so now he's not gone back to work. He's been six months now, and he's under the care of a psychiatrist. Something has happened. He's had a work injury. He's had stress at home. He's 17. His parents have gone through a divorce. He left his home, living with his aunt. There's some other psychological problem going on. He gets a small injury at his job. And before you know it, he's become a problem of a factitious disorder where he's creating problems and going to different hand specialists to try to get better. What he really needs is a psychiatrist. So what are the indicators that this is a factitious disorder? When the signs and symptoms and posture don't make sense, there's something wrong. If there is a wound that should have healed by now, there's something wrong. When they keep coming to different doctors, when they've been to Dr. Prabhu, and now they're coming to see Dr. Pankaj, or they're going to see Dr. Muni, and when Dr. Muni says, I'm going to call Dr. Prabhu and get your notes. No, 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 don't need to get his notes because I didn't get on well with him. Don't get his notes. Because the fact is, when you get notes from Dr. Prabhu, you'll see that Dr. Prabhu has said, this patient should not have an operation. They're manipulating their signs. They don't want you to get medical records from somewhere else. When you tell them, I want to do your nerve conduction study, and the nerve conduction study says their nerve conduction is normal, you know what they're going to say? They're going to say the nerve conduction machine was wrong. The doctor didn't do it properly. He was distracted. He was talking to his uh, a wife during on the phone. He wasn't doing the test properly. I think it's all wrong. 
So these patients, will, they will dispute every lab test and every result that you will do. And when you tell them, I think this is a psychological problem, they will often turn angry on you and say, what are you saying? I'm a crazy, you're saying something wrong with me, something wrong with you, you can't diagnose what, and they will walk out of your clinic in a disruptive manner. But the key is that you don't want to operate on them because these people will be very, very willing to have an operation. How do we treat these patients? Obviously, they need our empathy, right? You can't, you can't just dismiss them. So we have to say, look, I know you have a problem. I'm going to make your wound better. However, I need to do this. I need to put a block on your arm and I need to see if your fingers can be straightened. If they've got an ulcer, you say, I have to put this in a cast, otherwise your ulcer cannot get better. It's a very complicated type of ulcer. But I need you to see my friend here. He's a psychologist. Sometimes patients don't mind seeing a psychologist. They don't want to see a psychiatrist. I don't, you know, I want you to see the psychologist. I think you've got some stress, right? What's your situation? And usually they will gradually open out to you and then you'll be able to send them to see a psychologist and they need behavioral therapy. They need psychotherapy. Generally, the prognosis with Munchausen syndrome is poor. With some of these other conditions like clench fist syndrome with psychotherapy and then they can get better. But generally, don't operate. Get splints, get casts, and do simple things. Don't make a surgery. Don't give them a scar. Or all they will do is make matters worse for you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Binda. That was that was so fantastic, and just just uh, brings to memory uh, a number of cases that would have had this diagnosis over the last 20, 22 years, and I'm sure would be the experience of most of us. Yeah, I sure. have a couple of questions for you, Dr. Binder. Uh, sure. One, uh, the problem that I have faced with such patients is whatever you write on paper, uh, they are going to read it, and uh, then the cycle is going to continue. So in order to help these patients, I, uh, I have tried to take the relatives into confidence but I have always found myself at the, uh, uh, you know, at a conflicting point where I should write uh, the factitious uh, nature of the disorder on the paper, or just in order to take, keep the patient in confidence, uh, uh, not mention too many things on paper. So that that's been one uh, issue uh, that I have faced. And the second question is about: Is there any role of Sham surgeries in this. Any role of sorry, what? Sham surgeries. Oh, you you know, you just place an incision and uh, make patients oh, believe that you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, you raise a good point. You raise a good point. The thing is, uh, you're right. It's hard to know what to put down on paper. And and you and I, uh, the main thing is we are not psychological experts, right? We are not psychiatrists. And sometimes these patients have a medical case or a legal case, right? So what I, my answer is, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I'm a hand specialist. And I can tell you the physical signs and do, do not fit into the picture, right? So the first thing I write to offer is, this patient is not a candidate for surgery. That's the first thing I tell the patient. Surgery will not make you better because the moment as a surgeon, you do an operation, even if you talk about doing a sham operation, you now own the problem. As a surgeon, you don't own the patient until you do an operation. So as long as you don't do the operation, you're okay. You can get off the hook. So you will, like, as you said, speak to the family in confidence. If it's a child, speak to the parents, right? And in the, in the notes, you say it doesn't fit in. This is likely a non-organic condition and needs psychological assessment. After other causes are ruled out. So needs a neurological assessment, needs very specialists to see it, but dear GP, this is not a surgical candidate. So that's the best way to kind of summarize that you're not going to do an operation. And the truth is either the family will see and they'll, they'll agree with you and they'll go see a psychologist. The problem is they may not agree with you, right? Which is often the case. And they'll go to another hand specialist. But what you're saying is, and look between you, as a surgeon and as a specialist, you can always say, I don't think surgery will make you better. Nobody can, nobody can challenge you on that, right? You could see someone with a, with a fracture or a wrist arthritis. You could say, 
I don't think surgery will make you better in my hands, right? You're welcome to seek a second opinion. So I think the safest thing is not to operate. If you operate, right, they will then create a new problem like that lady with the cubital tunnel, correct? The doctor said nerve conduction is normal. The physical signs are negative, but the patient is insisting on an operation. They want you to do an operation, Pankaj. So if you do an operation, you've now started the cycle of them creating a, a factitious disorder. So they want someone to create the lesion. So I think doing the surgery would, would have to be, uh, would create more problems than solutions. So. So <clears throat> can I, can I interrupt? Sure, yes, yeah. Pankaj, Welcome, can sir. I come in? Welcome, Welcome sir. Dr. Okay. So, uh, Professor Randy, I think it was wonderful and something out of the box for hand surgeons. And I think this was a great eye opener for all Indian hand surgeons that you have come. And we know, and we go a long way back. And I used to see you as a student, postgraduate student <laughs> uh, in Tarapurwala right. class. And I still remember yes. you as a bright, naughty guy. But you still continue. <laughs> Continue to be a bright guy. I don't know about the naughty part. <laughs> I can also see uh, from your background that you have got a wonderful locale. And I can yes. believe that you all hand surgeons do extremely well from the place that you have got a background from. So yeah. I think this uh, lecture really opens our eyes to different factitious disorders, which we have really not given a thought about. And uh, we come across such patients time and again. And I think they fool us most of the times because we are not really aware of the psychosomatic problems of hand. And you have really given a great, great lecture today. And I, I really learned a lot from this lecture. I can tell you that, Randy. And I have always been uh, an, a silent admirer of yours because I have learned quite a few things uh, in the past. And uh, because of Sudhir, we've got a little closer in the past. And I had called you for the hand surgery meet. Uh, uh, our Indian national meet uh, in, I think, 2000 when Dr. Tara Purwala yes. was the president and yes. I was the secretary then. And I remember you since then and you had given a wonderful lecture that time also. So I thank you very much for keeping in touch with us and uh, giving great this thing. And we would expect you to come again uh, time and again and we'll trouble you for that. And I know you will not, you will oblige us. Uh, now talking about MSOS, Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society, which was formed way back in 2008 by some like-minded people like Dr. Subnis, myself, Rathod, etc. We thought that there was a little bit of uh, neglect to the suburban guys and uh, Mumbai Orthopedic Society uh, members who were very senior and good were in Bombay Orthopedic Society meetings. Uh, the suburban guys did not get a chance to talk and they were always backbenchers. So we thought that we will have, because there are lots of members who were from the suburbs and they were unable to attend these Bombay Orthopedic Society meetings and clinical meetings, etc. So you will be surprised that we have more than 700 members now of MSOS. And uh, thanks to Dr. Mutha, we have rejuvenated this um, MSOS and we have started doing this. And this is the first of the series where we are going to have every Sunday a different parts of the body or regional part which will be discussed threadbare by different youngsters from across Mumbai and those who are mainly practicing in suburbs, those who really do not get a chance to get into this. So this yeah. is really a youngster society and a young society, which we, of course, there is no competition between Bombay Orthopedic Society because we are part of Bombay Orthopedic Society and we will continue to remain so. This is only to give some kind of participation and some kind of encouragement to the youngsters who have come in suburbs. And I'm glad Randy, you have come here today, and uh, incidentally, you are the first guest lecture, so you should be proud about That's right. it. <laughs> so, so, so Excellent. To, uh, and yeah. we have our own set of orthopedic surgeons who are practicing exclusive hand surgery, and we are glad that you come time and again to uh, help them, encourage them, and you keep on coming to India quite often, uh, helping in the hand society, uh, and also giving some expositions, orations, etc. So I am really grateful for you to coming uh, today. In uh, I think it must be around 10:30, 11 o'clock there. What is the time there? It's uh, 2 2:30. 2 yeah. 30. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. So you are on the yeah. other part of the yeah. thing. Okay, all right. I we are ahead of you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Ahead of. okay, fine. 
So thank you very much yeah. uh, again for coming on Sunday and meeting us and giving an excellent out of the box lecture for all of us to learn something from. And I'll hand over to Dr. Mutha and Pankaj Ayer for the uh, um, for the next proceedings. Thanks, Randy. Come again. Thanks. All the Thanks, best. Thanks, Ram. Thanks. Very good to see you. Good to see you. Can I ask a question to Dr. Bindra? Pankaj. Sure. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. quite often come across patients whom we have operated for a carpal tunnel syndrome. And they, you know, continue to complain of some vague paresthesia or whatever, which is also not well descript, you know, the area of distribution. You repeat the clinical test, the clinical signs, the EMG, nothing indicates anything. But they keep on complaining time and again. I understand there would be some actual genuine regions, uh, reasons for persistence of symptoms. But how can you filter out the guys who are just malingering or out there to eat your brains? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a hard one, right? Because, because not all of them are truly factitious, correct? Some of them are just symptom exaggerating, you know. And, you know, I don't want to be uh, typecasting any, but we see a lot of ladies, Asian ladies generally will always want some attention. They're complaining a lot, right? So there's a little bit of symptom exaggeration, right? Not Again, I said, I don't want to be typecasting. Yes, it's a social thing, right? They're working hard at home. They're getting no time, no sympathy. Uh, and this is the only time they're getting some sympathy and attention. So, well, you know, you have to rule out other conditions. So you have to do cervical spine, make sure there's no compression there. You're going to check them in the proximal arm to make sure they don't have proximal median nerve compression. And sometimes then you do a, you, you do a carpal, uh, another nerve conduction study. And usually nerve conduction study will start to show some improvement, correct? And then it's just a matter of reassurance saying, here's your new test. The numbers are getting better. Unfortunately, a little bit of numbness does remain. You know, I think it's very hard to become completely normal. We are not children anymore. You know, as you get older, your body doesn't recover fully. And you have to kind of make them start to accept that that is what it is. But the important thing to say is there is no further surgery needed. I think that's where, as surgeons, if we draw the line, often for a lot of patients, they then can go back to the GP and they can look at other treatment. And you can often suggest other non-allopathic medicine, right? Like over here, we don't have Ayurvedic and homeopathic and all, but we send them to acupuncture and other things. So sometimes we say, you know what? Modern medicine has limits and we've reached our limit. I've done what I can do. Now you can look at other alternative medical treatments, but I can tell you, you don't need another operation. So don't go asking for surgeries, go and look at other forms of treatment, yoga, stretching, uh, et cetera. So try, try to get them off. I mean, you can't help them anymore. So no point bringing them back and doing more stuff on them. Uh, uh, Professor Bindra, uh, so so uh, uh, d d does it not reiterate the fact that we, we need to have as much of objective recording of the clinical findings as possible, including simple cases like carpal tunnel syndrome, where where most often, I mean, even even, even so-called specialists too, uh, will will depend on a touch of a finger or a wisp of a cotton to record hyperesthesia. And not many of us will actually record a two-point discrimination or Sims-Weinstein pressure filaments, which the patient may not be aware of exactly how to respond to those. Yes. Uh, because then you are not just simply asking, how do you feel? You are actually objectively recording. Do, do, you, do you see a, a, a very diligent recording of these symptoms could actually be able to filter out the cases which Satish was talking about? Yeah, I think... Uh... You know, we have the, the luxury of having hand therapists in our clinic. So they will do a sensory mapping for every patient before they see the specialist. So at least we have documentary evidence. And certainly if there is a patient where, and sometimes we'll do, an, we'll do an operation even without a nerve conduction study, if everything fits in and the patient looks genuine, you know, if the story is clear, they're otherwise healthy, they've got the night symptoms, the clinical exam fits in. There doesn't seem to be exaggeration. We don't necessarily get nerve conduction studies for every patient, but we get it whenever and wherever possible. So it helps if they don't get better. But largely, I think the documentation is the key. And ideally, if you have a hand therapist or a therapist in your clinic 
you train your staff to do two point discrimination and sems weinstein because it doesn't need any specialist training it'll be nice if you have a little bit good documentation it always you know as you and i know whenever you're invited to court whether for your own issue or to help a colleague it's always a documentation in the end isn't it and the quality of your documentation helps you okay. yeah uh do do any of the panelists uh, gautam uh, bipin rohan milin ha- do you have any question for dr bindra uh dr bindra i have a question if that's okay yeah gautam go ahead yeah so uh so whatever you said in the lecture i saw quite few of them in the uk however uh, the practice in india is completely different uh yeah. pay patients pay for themselves so yeah. the more word of not getting an operation rather than getting an operation yeah so they they always coming into a clinic hoping that oh i hope the doctor says no operation required yeah now in that scenario i have not seen a lot of uh, uh, malingering that is happening in my clinic at least however my practice is very young in india so i don't know i mean you have trained here so i i don't know if there was a lot of it at that time as well uh, but how do you kind of pick them up in the in the current practice in in indian scenario where everything is pretty much financially related i think in the indian scenario i found more often were problems like multiple joint pains right Correct. aches and pains everywhere yeah. right and very few specific things so yeah. the challenge always there was what can i see can i identify a treatable problem can i find a little bit of carpal tunnel or something that i can help or is it somebody i'm just going to say i can't help you you need to do general exercises see a therapist make sure they're not hypothyroid so in india it was more of generalized aches and pains and uh, you know and usually they're looking for placebo right they're looking for vitamin yeah, d yeah. you can treat their osteoporosis you can help them in some ways but you're right they they generally need more reassurance less surgery right it's more of a depression kind of scenario rather than factitious disorders correct i think slightly different right yes the, the only other thing i have faced is i have seen a couple of patients that i have done carpal tunnels on have come back with crps now i didn't see a lot of that in the uk i had the odd one that would come back with crps but uh, that is something that keeps alarming me here so i don't know is there is there a way of identifying who's probably going to get crps is there something i need to do before i do the carpal tunnel because i do carpal tunnel only if i get a nerve conduction study positive yeah because in india yeah. everything is financially related they need evidence for everything yes yes yeah no i i wouldn't be able to predict which ones i think the ones that have severe carpal tunnel beforehand though yes. i do warn them that they will have a period of exacerbation of symptoms because i think they get a bit of flare response after the nerve is decompressed and the example i give it to them is when you wake up and you've been sleeping on a leg awkwardly you feel the pins and needles when you wake up so i say when your nerve is released it wakes up and you get increasing symptoms sometimes and we may have to give you medications to calm it down so i think in someone with a severe carpal tunnel with a severe block on the nerve conduction study you may have to give them some uh, medication post operatively like lyrica or one of those medications if they get this response as they're recovering because they they are your they are your recurrent patients they just keep coming yeah. they they will yeah. come every time you tell yes. them to come yeah because they right. are hopeful that the doctor is going to make us a little bit more better than what we are yes sure yeah yeah wow so so b- between between gautam and professor bindra we had a experience of uh, four continents so <laughs> so that, that 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 was a wonderful discussion <laughs> and and and, and the, the, the reason i uh, you, you know i thought this would this would be a good talk to have uh, from you to professor bindra was i believe but for some genetic and racial differences people are the same everywhere so Correct. so so the, this uh, Uh, factitious disorders are may not be very unique to a region or a, or a country or, or or an economy socio economic class i think they exist everywhere and by law of averages gautam i'm sure you will see many of those 
in Mumbai too. That, yeah. Thank you, Professor Binda. I think that was fantastic okay. beginning of a Sunday morning for us and perhaps a nap time for you. Australia, yeah. thank you very much for yes. joining. Thank you. So, so we, we would we would love to have you for the rest of the session, but we we'll leave it to you. Leave it to you. You can you can you can exercise your choice. Thank you very much. Just you being here for so long means a lot to us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Binda, for coming and again enlightening us. We'll meet again. Great. Thanks. All right. It will Bye. be nice, sir, if you can hang around and share with us your valuable inputs at every stage. Sure, I will. Thank you. It's 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 now my pleasure to invite my younger colleague, uh, Dr. Bipin Gangulde. Uh, Bipin is. Uh, extremely well-trained uh, hand surgeon, has had his initial training at Ganga Hospital and then uh, trained with Professor Doi in Japan, uh, the, the mecca of uh, brachial plexus surgery. And uh, currently, Bipin focuses on the, on the pediatric upper limb problems. Uh, he's attached to uh, Wadia Hospital, uh, Wadia Children's Hospital, Mumbai, and he's doing extremely good work. And uh, I'm, I'm, he's going to share uh, with us uh, his... Uh, uh, insights about thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, uh, Bipin, uh, you are ready with your yeah. presentation? Yes. yes Over to yes. you, Bipin. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pankaj Aire, for uh, such a welcoming talk like about me. And uh, Dr. Bindra, your talk was excellent. The word Munchausen syndrome was a multiple choice question for me in my exam of European Diploma in Hand Surgery. First question was this one. <laughs> so... I still remember that question. And uh, before the reading for the exam, I didn't know what was it. So it was uh, again a revision for me when you went through this factitious disorder. Uh, now this thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, normally it is it, most of it, most of the surgeons in India and the medical professionals feel that people are falsely telling they are having pain. Like it is a sort of factitious syndrome. People think that the doctors feel that the patient has no illness. However, I'm going to tell you some tests or some investigations which might prove that it, the patient is having a real problem. So it is like a, a thing which people in India feel because we are unable to rule out this condition and most of us are unable to diagnose it properly or uh, having uh, problems in diagnosing, including hand surgeons or specialists because uh, it is a very difficult thing to diagnose. So by definition, it is a collection of symptoms which is brought about by abnormal compression of the neurovascular bundle by bony, ligamentous or muscular structures in a narrow space between the clavicle and the first rib. So this is the thoracic outlet syndrome definition. So what are the levels of compression? So there are three levels of compression. So as you go along on the upper side, this is the first level of compression. This is called as an interscalene triangle. This is the first level. So it is bound by the anterior scalene muscle, the middle scalene muscle, and down you have the first rib. The structures which go through this uh, interscalene triangle are obviously seen in this diagram are the subclavian artery, vein, and the brachial plexus. Second area of compression is the costoclavicular space. So this comes below the clavicle. So as the brachial plexus and the neurovascular bundle passes through below the clavicle, it, it forms the second area of compression. So mo mostly it, uh, it is bound by the uh, subclavius muscle here. And in this area, the main compressing fact, uh, feature, I mean the organ which is compressed mainly is the subclavian vein. However, there can be now compressions also in this area. Third space which is compressed is the below the pectoralis minor muscle. So finally, the brachial plexus and the neurovascular bundle pass below the pectoralis minor muscle and it forms the another third triangle. So this is the sub-pectoral minor space. This is an anatomical dissection uh, or cadaveric dissection which shows the, sorry, yeah, which shows the subcostal space and the subpectoral space. Structures at risk in this type of in a thoracic outlet syndrome are the brachial plexus, mainly the lower plexus, C8 T1, subclavian artery, and the subclavian vein. 
we classify a thoracic outlet syndrome into two types mainly the vascular which is very uncommon and the neurogenic which is very common a vascular syndrome is uh, distinguished into another two types is the arterial and the venous type and a neurogenic is also classified into two types is a true neurogenic type which is normally electrophysiologically positive like you will get get some findings on the emg ncv and the non specific type that is there are no findings on the emg ncv so the non specific type is the most commonest and 95% people have a non specific type of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome here is the uh, here is the problem with the diagnosis because most of them have non specific uh, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome so as i said neurogenic type out, uh, accounts for 90% and vascular 3 to 4% so the causes for thoracic outlet syndrome of anything which intervenes or causes uh, compresses the structures in these three triangles can cause a thoracic outlet syndrome first and the most common is the cervical rib then there can be a long c7 transverse process anomalous insertion of the scalenous muscle or scalenous muscle atrophy hypertrophy the, there can be a scalenous minimus muscle abnormal binds or ligaments a fractured clavicle which throws a lot of callus or a first rib which can throw a lot of callus can also compress this area and exostosis and tumors in these areas so there can be variation in the scalenous muscle which causes compression the cervical ribs and anomalous first rib so cervical rib is a extra rib which arises normally from the seventh cervical vertebra and rarely it arises from the sixth or fifth cervical vertebra remember in most of the patients the most of the subjects there is a cervical rib from childhood and it is very common in uh, bilateral bilaterally they have a cervical rib however only 10 to 15% of the patients are symptomatic with bilateral cervical rib so not all patients having cervical rib will be called as a thoracic outlet syndrome so you will have to do some test to find out that it is a cervical outlet sorry it is a thoracic outlet syndrome or any other compression neuropathy like or, or like we know it can be a ulnar compression in the in the cubital tunnel or the guyans can or a median no compression anywhere along so these are the types of cervical rib we normally see in the clinical scenario on the x-rays and on ct scans it can be bony completely bony it can be fibrous and bony or it can be completely fibrous or only there can be a bony swelling in the end the so normally for noting the cervical uh, rib finding the cervical rib we take a normal pa x-ray of the chest however lordotic views are very important which shows the apex of the lungs and the cervical ribs clearly as seen in this picture so what are the what are the symptoms of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome so, as most common is the neurotic type a neurogenic type so neurotic pain most commonly along the c8 t1 is the like along the ulnar nerve area so patient will complain or intractable pain or radiating pain or sensory loss along the ulnar nerve area there can be interosseous muscle atrophy there can be headaches trapezial pains muscle weakness there can be atrophy of the muscles there can be some vasomotor signs due to uh, ganglion problems or there can be a hypersensitivity and crps venous compression are mostly in due to in the sub uh, costal region there can be acute occlusion due to a thrombus which is lost in the vein this can be a syndromic uh, problem mainly so there can be pain tightness and discomfort during surgery so in a chronic scenario it can be a increased venous pattern or tenderness tenderness in a axillary vein area and gangrene is very rare arterial problems uh, arterial compressions are also very common commoner than the venous problems there can be a digital ischemia hand ischemia cutaneous ulceration forearm pain and a bruy or a, a pulsatile mass can be seen in the supraclavicular area so most common most the most, the diff difficult problem is the diagnosis so how will you diagnose a thoracic outlet syndrome the most important thing to diagnose a thoracic outlet syndrome is are the provocative clinical maneuvers so even if the even if you do hundreds of investigation those are your backup but the provocative clinical maneuvers are the most important thing to diagnose a 
thoracic outlet syndrome the other investigations which you can do are the radiography ultrasound and mr can be done a ct is done ct angio is done angiography is done and a venography is also done so this is this is this is written by david roos the most accurate diagnosis of the thoracic outlet syndrome must rely on a careful history and thorough appropriate physical examination and that is it that is the crux of this talk like physical examination is very important in a thoracic outlet syndrome no signal no single diagnostic test is sufficient to specifically prove or exclude the diagnosis of thoracic outlet syndrome it is a diagnosis of exclusion so after you have ruled out your carpal tunnels your ulnar pains your other problems in the distal in the peripheral nerves everything you rule out you don't label the patient as a psychiatric patient or the patient with psych factitious disorders you have to find out if the final thing the thoracic outlet syndrome is in play because mo most of the clinicians they will label the patient as a factitious disorder and then one note the the person who has examined him on the first day the the diagnosis continues to remain with him for life and the continue the patient continues to have pain for life so always rule out other compression neuropathies in a physical examination always look for the distal pulse compare it with the opposite side edema cyanosis any veins or dilated veins in the supraclavicular area tenderness over the scalenus or the pectoralis minor muscle as in a trigger points reduce sensation to very light touch on fingers and and the provocative maneuver uh, maneuver so what is a provocative man maneuver the provocative test is a test it should be reproduced any test which should be reproduced is a provocative test so in thoracic outlet syndrome normally the radial pulses get diminished or obliterated so there have been multiple provocative maneuvers in the uh, history and there ha it has been described we are not going to go in the details of all the provocative maneuvers so as in literature this this is this is what greens have given adsens right and halsted test halsted is the person who has described uh, thoracic outlet syndrome in the beginning of 1800s so they, these all older tests are they frequently come positive in normal population they are neither sensitive nor specific so we in in our literature or in in our uh, post graduation days we always learn this test how to do this, this test but the single most important test what, what which is important and has a very high sensitivity is the roos test so this is the roos test normally what you do this is also called as external uh, uh, this is this is all the uh, arm is held in external rotation and arm for uh, elbow in 90 degrees and the patient is asked to do this maneuver of flexion and extension of the uh, palm uh, of uh, like gripping and uh, leaving the grip very vigorously for 3 minutes so you always look for the reproduction of the symptoms fatigue pain or any nerve symptoms as you can see in this patient this is given by dr pankaj ahire you can see this side is looking vascular like there is it is pink however after doing the maneuver for some time you can see this hand this hand is become pale so this is a classical roos test so you have to do this test and this is the only test which i recommend instead of doing other all manuals you can do other manuals you can do physical examination but roos test is the single most important test which is has to be done so how do you interpret the roos test in a neurogenic uh, thoracic outlet syndrome there can be heaviness progressive weakness numbness tingling in the fingers fingers and uh, and progression in uh, of the symptoms on arm up venus has a synotic arm with distended forearm veins and arterial uh, thoracic outlet syndrome can show ischemia and cramping pain after you get this test positive go for lordotic views find out if, the, if there is a cervical rib or any other problem in the in the x ray do a pa view as well as a lordotic view however the drawbacks of the uh, x rays are that you cannot see soft tissue anomalies hence you have to go ahead with the other uh, test so there are uh, specialized imaging in a thoracic outlet syndrome angiography is the gold standard for thoracic outlet syndrome however angiography is only mainly for arterial type of compression hence we have to get a duplex sonography a venography and always do a positional maneuver during all these studies consider bilateral studies so this is a 
uh, test uh, angiography, a CT angiogram basically, which is showing that there is no compression in uh, when the patient is in normal uh, adducted position. However, as soon as you extend and abduct the arm, you can see there is a compression in the subclavian area. So this is a classical CT angio picture uh, in a thoracic outlet arterial uh, syndrome. This is a static uh, uh, thoracic uh, stat static CT angiogram, which is showing compression at the first rib area, and there is a distension of the subclavian artery distal to that. So this is also this this patient also had a severe pain in his in in his arm, but this was uh, the pro uh, it, did, it didn't need any provocative maneuvers. It, it the patient just had pain. So a CT angio showed this thing uh, very vividly. Electrodiagnostic uh, evaluation like the EMG NCV, typically with neurogenic uh, type of uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, it can have a normal, as I said, electrodiagnostic study. However, it is important to do this test to rule out other compression neuropathies like the carpal tunnel or the uh, cubital tunnel syndromes. Treatment is very, the, the most important thing is to treat it conservatively, conservatively in the beginning. So if the patient has mild symptoms, uh, numbness, and uh, pain on rouge test, try to treat it conservatively. So you have to uh, modify the posture and uh, correct the faulty posture, manipulate and mobilize and relax the first rib, clavicular and other muscles, strengthen the shoulder girdle muscles, and you can stretch the scalenous muscle. Pain control medications can be given ultrasound by a physiotherapist, TENS can be given and local anesthetic in injections have also been tried. So what are the indications of surgeries? Failure of supervised exercise and postural program for more than three months or more can, is an indication for surgery. Then intractable pain in the first visit itself is an indication for surgery. Significant neurological deficit which is progressing when the present patient has presented to you. And if there is an impeding vascular catastrophe usually of an arterial origin, is an indication for surgery. So these are the specific indications for surgery in a thoracic outlet syndrome. What do I remember during surgery of thoracic outlet syndrome? Take a detailed consent of possible complication because it is a very critical area which a surgeon is going to enter. So always take a detailed consent. However, however uh, trained the surgeon is, there can be complications. So detailed uh, a consent is always necessary. Assistant for me should be could be a vascular surgeon or a trained hand and upper limb surgeon and a brachial plexus surgeon. I would always like to have an assistant with me or a senior mentor with me with me who is well who has taught me do, uh, during his course for this surgery because it is a very critical surgery and you don't want because single small mistake can injure critical structures there. So approaches are supraclavicular approach, which is a preferred approach by most of the surgeons and a transaxillary approach. Supraclavicular approach is mostly used for a cervical rib excision and transaxillary approach is used uh, by surgeons for recurrent thoracic outlet syndrome and for the excision of the first rib. So this is a supraclavicular approach. This, these pictures are given to my, uh, be my mentor, Dr. Raja Savapati and Dr. Hari from Ganga Hospital. So as you take the supraclavicular incision and retract the uh, platysma and the uh, sternocleidomastoid, you go and enter on, on the scalenous muscle. You can see a phrenic no phrenic no always crosses the, crosses the scalenous anticus muscle. And the, you can see the brachial plexus roots there and there. Retract and uh, you divide the scalenous anticus muscle. You see what you see down is a subclavian artery and the brachial plexus. Here, the subclavian artery can be seen very clearly. And as soon as you retract, this subclavian artery has a, uh, uh, as a transverse cervical artery here. You, you can ligate it if the subclavian artery is not moving. Retract the subclavian artery medially, and you can see the cervical rib down there, and the, this, and the cervical rib can be excised. So to conclude, diagnosis is mainly clinical, rouge test is most important. Neurogenic and non-specific, uh, neurogenic type is most common. Non-specific, electrodiagnostically negative are most common type of thoracic outlet syndrome. Dynamic CT angio may help in diagnosis. 
Supraclavicular approach is good for splenectomy and cervical rib excision. Transaxillary approach is used for first rib excision and in case of recurrence. So this is the uh, presentation. I, I would go ahead with the uh, what you say a case presentation. This case is shared to be my with uh, by me with from Ganga Hospital. So this is a case, uh, a very classical case. This uh, this case presented to us in Ganga Hospital when I was there as a resident, as a fellow there. So it it is a fourteen year old girl with a right hand dominant. Uh, she is a right hand dominant. Pain in the right neck radiating. She had a history of blunt trauma and she was unable to do activities of daily living. This is only a six month duration problem. Before that, she had no problems at all, no motor deficit. On clinical examination, there was mass on the right. Uh, side of the neck region and it was tender there is a uh, there was paresthesia along the cat1 region the radial artery pulsations were felt good so what any what else you could know you would know in the clinical examination uh, can anyone answer dr pankaj hello hello yeah yeah bipin Yes, can you can you tell me if after knowing this clinical uh, examination, can you tell me what else uh, would you like to know after uh, in this patient, so that we can go ahead with the diagnosis and the treatment of this patient? Yeah, the the first thing is, uh, I I would if if there is a palpable mass, I would always want to know what that mass is. So, I would definitely get a sonography of that area done, take a X ray if there is a bony contribution. Knowing that this is a thoracic outlet syndrome clinically, and there is a mass present, I will uh, uh, I would want to conclusively establish uh, cause and effect relationship with that whatever swelling that I am feeling in that area, or to rule it out. Okay, okay. So uh, you would first go with the clinical examination in detail more, and then you will go with investigation like X-ray or whatever uh, things will fall uh, next. so what we did was a provocative test so this is a classical provocative test if you can see this girl uh uh and she is doing what is called as a ruse maneuver for 3 minutes this is a classical ruse maneuver which the patient has to do she is unable to do it on the right side and she you you can see she has pain on the right side and she is unable to do it now that the provocative test are positive and we know that it is something compressing in the neck we go ahead with the other uh, investigations like dr pankaj said uh, his investigations of choice would be radiographs first so would you uh, anyone would add it with a ct mri and a electro diagnosis uh, sir ram prabhu sir hello okay rohan uh, yes bipin so uh... ram Hello. Hi, Bibin. This is Rohan. Hello. So I would go yes, ahead sir. with. I would go ahead with at least uh, you've the radiographs like Pankaj said. I would yes. do an uh, MRI and probably an MR uh, angiography so that you know you don't have to subject the patient to some other test. And EMG primarily to rule out other compressive pathologies. Okay. Okay, Rohan. Thank you. so we get we went ahead with the uh, radiographs and the radiograph showed something in the cervical region there was a, a cervical rib which was coming and uh, there was a callus also seen there in that area and we went ahead with a ct scan so these are the ct scan images this is a very unusual type of ct scan image if you can see the cervical rib is coming out the patient has a bilateral cervical rib uh, on this uh, ct image patient has a bilateral cervical rib however the cervical rib is uh, connecting with the first rib here and there is a pseudo arthrosis here like there is some connection here and there is some callus here like so in this on this side on the left side there is no connection between the cervical rib and the first rib however on the right side there is some connection between the cervical rib and the protrusion coming from the first rib so this is a very unusual type of finding which was uh, noted on a ct scan so we went ahead with an mri mri so showed that the, the 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 area which the cervical rib and the first rib were meeting is as showing edematous changes and a abnormal joint so there was a joint which was formed 
and uh, we concluded that it was a uh, it was a, a fracture or some pseudo arthrotic joint in that area so how would you manage uh, this patient now uh, uh, would you go with conservative management right away or you would you go with surgery uh, anyone can answer this question like uh, depends on the anyone can answer uh, dr bindra hello Hello. Always uh, start with uh, non-operative treatment. So, as you said, you know, yes. exercises to build up the the pectoral girdle. Yes. Uh, and uh, and see if that helps her. Obviously, okay. if it's a vascular problem, then I don't know that I would continue with conservative treatment. But if it's just neurological, then I would first try that and see, because sometimes whatever trauma initiated the callus may settle down. The callus may resorb, but uh, I would give them three months of treatment first before doing any surgical intervention. Okay, sir. So this uh, this patient uh, was uh, from a state uh, where uh, Sir Doctor uh, Praveen and Doctor Hari spoke, and they said, "Oh, sorry, sorry." Yeah. So and and they said that they have been doing the conservative management of for more than three months, and the pain was gradually increasing. patient was literally crying uh, and begging that she is having lot of pain and conservative uh, management was really failing so uh, they uh, went ahead and did the uh, surgery i think so that's reasonable the right there was a very clear pathology yes yes sir so a uh, transaxillary approach uh, you will use or a supraclavicular approach for this type of uh, uh, lesion uh bipin i i would request you to uh, move with your presentation yeah yeah and so that we could have question answers later if yeah. at all yeah yeah because we are running so short what, of time sorry sorry so what we what we did was we went ahead with the transclavi uh, supraclavicular approach and uh, you can see that the cervical rib was there and the pseudo arthrotic area was forming a callus and uh, it was compressing the structures below it and it was excised so the patient complained of complete relief in pain immediately after surgery however there was some pain due to the surgical site uh, incisions and these are the videos post these are root root test post 2 months of surgery you can see that the patient is performing the roost test without any severe pain and this continued for more than 3 uh, minutes actually so so this is like a uh, relief for her her mind is free she can do everything so this was the diagnosis which was missed by multiple people around the country and uh, conservative treatment she was labeled as a neurological uh, patient having a psychiatric problem however some tests and provocative maneuvers really proved that it was thoracic outlet syndrome so this uh, this case has been published by ganga hospital in journal of hand surgery american and uh, it has been a eye changer since then for me also since i was a student there i could learn more out of this case at that point of time it was eye changer uh, for me that always look for a th thoracic outlet syndrome in any case of peripheral nerve uh compression neuropathy so uh, most of the cases even if it is a carpal tunnel syndrome or a ulnar cubital syndrome i do a uh, uh, roost test uh, i'll tell you the problem what i i have i have a snapping ulnar nerve myself and uh, when i do a roost test i have a problem in the uh, cubital tunnel area and there is the the pain which increases after 2 minutes of doing the roost test so i i still feel I, i have been investigated for thoracic outlet syndrome there are no there is nothing in the neck so roost test can be positive also i feel in other problems of uh, uh thoracic uh, sorry in other problem now compression neuropathy however the site of pain is different like in a classical thoracic outlet syndrome you have pain originating from the neck region and radiating you have arterial symptoms you can have venous symptoms but other so like it there, there can be fatigue pain if you have any other compression neuropathy by doing a new roost test so this is a very sensitive test hence when you get roost test positive always rule out for a compression neuropathy thank you thank you bipin
Oh, that that was quite exhaustive. Uh, I I just have one question, not only to be pinned to the entire panel. Uh, have you have you found uh, a typical age group difference between patients with thoracic outlet syndrome who present with vascular problems and those who present with predominantly neurogenic problems? Uh, I I found that is the is the uh, the patient with vascular problems they they present fairly early. Uh, including in their second decade, whereas patients with neurogenic problems are the ones who usually present in the fourth decade onwards. I mean, is, is I'm not I'm not sure whether it's a common observation. Is it so? Has anybody found a similar observation in the age groups? Hello. Yeah. Feel 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 yeah. free to raise so your what, hand and what, talk. What what I feel that neurogenic problems are very common. and uh, the symptoms are not that very uh, problematic as in the arterial ha have you found uh, an age difference like this in your practice no i have not found or is it is it reported in literature anywhere like that no it is uh, there is no yeah. age difference reported in literature okay i am not yeah sure. rohan you wanted to say something angaj uh, yes. of course my uh, the the number of thoracic outlet that i have seen is less probably oh. 10 and all the 10 were adolescent females okay uh probably in the age group from 14 to 16 somehow okay. and it was always neurogenic okay. i have not seen a thoracic outlet syndrome uh in an adult after 18 years of age i don't know why uh but it has always been adolescent female after a growth spurt and neurogenic wow rohan that, that that's a strong statement uh uh non not seen anyone uh, after second decade because most patients that i see of neurogenic uh thoracic outlet syndrome are usually in the fourth decade uh, professor binda you have any closing comments on this it's a, it's a, as a bipin said it's a difficult diagnosis to make usually the vascular ones are easy to pick up right they come uh they come with a vascular problem the neurogenic ones are difficult and as bipin also said uh roos test is like a double crush sometimes right it's positive even if you have carpal tunnel so it's difficult to interpret so i mean i would normally treat the peripheral nerve first and then look for a thoracic outlet uh personally in in where i practice now the vascular surgeons uh manage thoracic outlet so if i feel they have it uh, i refer them to them i personally don't do it but i don't think it's a very common condition personally Yes. Okay. Uh, you know, I think when you make a reputation for it, Bipin, you'll see a lot more because they come to you. But uh, as part of practice, it's not that common. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Benda. Thanks, Bipin. That was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I I now invite uh, another younger colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Milin Sirwade. He practices in the uh, extended uh, suburbs of Mumbai. and he's is is a keen uh, upper limb surgeon uh, growing in his practice milin are you yes, ready sir. with your presentation he's going to sp speak to us about pearls and pitfalls in the management of metacarpophalangeal joint dislocations over to you milin just a second i'll just give i think oh we can see your screen yeah. there oh, yeah perfect so no, but it starts from the middle actually i just i need to start from the beginning yeah just go to the first slide yeah perfect yes sir yeah <clears throat> can you see yes and i'm i'm audible also perfect yes, yes. yes. go ahead thank you very good thank you sir thank you uh, so my topic is uh, metacarpophalangeal dislocation pearls and pitfalls this is relatively uncommon usually it is on the dorsal side compared to holer the holer is very very rare and usually it is on the border digits that means index uh, thumb and the little finger and broadly it is classified into two types simple and the complex so by definition any irreducible dislocation is called as a complex dislocation so let's see what is complex and simple so you, <clears throat> you can see that simple in both there is a tear of the holer plate 
from the proximal attachment but in simple you can see the holar plate is still draping the uh, the uh, metacarpal head it is not still flipped back in complex you can see the holar plate has gone behind the metacarpal head so th that makes the uh, reduction very very difficult almost impossible in complex dislocation so what is the pathomechanics of this complex dislocation which is very well described by kaplan in 1957 usually it starts with the hyperextension injury which causes tear of the holar plate from its proximal attachment or the metacarpal neck and then the holar plate holar plate sits on the dorsal aspect of the head so the holar plate is interposed in the M mcp joint and there is a, this particular noose of soft tissue structures which make the reduction very very difficult so what are the structures which form the tight finger trap like uh, thing on around the neck of the uh, metacarpal so these are the four structures we can see usually the flexor tendon on the radial as uh, the ulnar aspect of the metacarpal head the lumbricle on the radial aspect the superficial transverse ligament on the super uh, proximal aspect and the deep transverse and volar plate on the dorsal or distal aspect of the metacarpal head so these all these four structures form a tight noose which around the neck of the metacarpal which makes the reduction very very difficult in a complex dislocation and also you can notice one thing one structure this is a digital nerve especially the radial digital nerve in the index finger which is being tented by the metacarpal head and it is almost subcutaneous in this um, particular dislocation so particularly when we are approaching it by holar approach it is very very highly prone to get damage if the surgeon is not careful enough to take the incision itself because it is lying under the skin so that's how the patient comes to you with the history of injury like hyperextension type of injury and the position of the finger is like that the hyperextension at the mp joint and a flexion at the uh, interphalangeal joint along with that you can see the pucker sign at the metacarpal phalangeal joint and there is some ulnar deviation of the index finger so this is clinically how the patient is present then the next thing that you usually do is a regular x rays that is ap lateral and the oblique views in which it is very well seen that the, there is some incongruity of the metacarpal phalangeal joint but apart from that you also notice that whether there is any osteochondral fragment which is coming from the metacarpal head because that will change our approach and number 2 we should also look for the presence of sesamoid bone into the metacarpal phalangeal joint because that signifies that it's probably a complex dislocation and it is very unlikely to get the reduction by uh, close maneuver so that's how we we see we investigate the patient next thing once you have confirmed the diagnosis of the metacarpal phalangeal dislocation next thing is to reduce it as early as possible and that is to be done under good anesthesia with full relaxation uh, maybe regional block or general anesthesia so as long as it is a simple dislocation this maneuver of wrist flexion that is very very important because that will relax that flexor tendon and pushing the base of the proximal phalanx slight uh, we have to do little hyper extension and push the base of the proximal phalanx distally and holarly so usually in simple dislocation we get the reduction with this particular maneuver but the pitfall in this is always there should not be any no amount of traction should be applied to the finger because that will make the noose of soft tissue structure more tight and that will definitely not give the reduction or all and <clears throat> and also that is uh, uh, that converts the simple dislocation into complex dislocation because the traction itself causes more damage to the uh, more tear of the proximal attachment of the holar plate and it will cause the holar plate to flip back on the dorsal aspect of the metacarpal head another thing the pitfall is having multiple attempts of reduction that is still you have to you have to prevent that because avoid that because uh, if you are doing repeated attempts that will that is going to cause damage to the metacarpal head avascular necrosis and probably a later osteoarthritis changes and in pediatric population you may get the physeal arrest 
so once this uh, this reduction is achieved uh, if it is a simple dislocation you can get it go ahead with the body taping and early mobilization but then if you don't get if you don't get the reduction that is what you see clinically you will not be able to achieve the full flexion if you are not got the full reduction and the, the flexion will be having a springy uh, end point another thing that you will notice is puckering is still present and on the x ray you will see on the or on the cm image you will see a widened joint space that means you are not got the reduction so the next step that comes is a open reduce or open reduction and that, these are the two approaches which we can go for and both are good both have pros and cons so usually the palm the proponents of palm palmer approach that say is a palmer approach goes through the already disrupted tissues so because the lesion is on the holer side the soft tissue nous is on the holer side where we are going through the damaged tissue so we are not damaging the we are not uh, causing any surgical insult to the uh, healthy tissue that's one and the, so that's that's how you uh, preserve the dorsal extensor mechanism dorsal capsule and that offers stability to the reduced joint in the flexion and that's how we can mobilize the joint early but the dorsal is a safe and simple approach very easy because it gives a direct access to the holer plate which is flipped back on the metacarpal head and in the dorsal approach there is a very there is no risk to damage the digital nerve which is which can happen in the holer approach if the surgeon is not aware of the uh, radial digital nerve lying beneath the skin and if there is a osteochondral fragment you can access it through the dorsal approach and we cannot get it through holer so these are the downside of the holer approach also we cannot get the access to holer plate from holer side because it has already flipped on the back side and the osteochondral fragment also we cannot get through holer approach so uh, i i got this i am grateful to dr randy bendra sir who has given me his case so this is a young lady who presented one week after the injury um with the hyperextension uh, mechanism and this is how she presents so this is there is a hyperextension slight hyperextension of the mp joint and flexion of the interphalangeal and this is the x ray so in this we can see that there is a dislocation but there is a osteochondral very good quality so there is a osteochondral fragment and in this case i think the dorsal approach is the right choice to go for and that's how uh, this, uh, so this is a lateral x ray so this is how we go for the dorsal approach dorsal is a very easy and a, a very safe approach in which we take a, a midline incision centered over the mp joint we cut the skin subcute go to the extensor apparatus split the extensor mechanism in the center reflect then you go to the capsule cut the capsule in the center release the hematoma and then you get back to, get to the polar plate which is entrapped inside the joint so this is a metac uh, this is osteochondral fragment and this is a holer plate which is entrapped into the metacarpophalangeal joint so we have to slit the holer plate in the again in the center and that will just give us a reduction and that's how we see now this is a um, osteochondral fragment but there is nothing interposing now in the metacarpophalangeal joint and that's how we get the reduction the the metacarp the dorsal fragment osteochondral fragment can be fixed with the k wire and that's how we get the reduction so that's case number 1 uh another case uh, i got from dr aman patankar sir so this is like a young chap with the uh, hyperextension injury and presenting almost 10 days after the injury this was approached through a polar uh, approach so, so this is the x ray there is no osteochondral fragment which is obvious on this x ray so both approaches are okay and in this case particularly the holer approach was taken you can see the radial nerve which is tented by the metacarpal head and it if the surgeon is not aware he can easily cut the neurovascular bundle but the easy part here is once you go the go to the holer approach we can just cut the a1 pulley so that will release the flexor tendon and one of the four tight structure in the nose so flexor tendon is released and you can very well put a freer elevator and get the metacarpal head back you can uh, 
the advantage of holer approach is we have to, we can preserve the holer plate with, rather than cutting it and you can retrieve the holer plate yes so that's the post of um, x ray with the well reduced joint and the clinical picture so post op protocol is usually we immobilize the joint mp joint in 45 degree of flexion for 3 weeks for next 3 weeks we give the extension block splint to start the range of motion but avoid hyper extension in that uh, for next 3 weeks and after 6 uh, weeks we can start the patient on uh, light activities yeah i think that's enough thank you thank you sir thank you milin uh Thanks. uh milin couple of things uh, yes, not not only a question to you but to the entire panel uh is there really a pressing need to uh, immobilize these uh, dislocations after reduction uh for 3 weeks because i found that once they are reduced they are stable and the dictum that i have followed is if these joints look unstable upon reduction it is not the in, it's not an unstable reduction actually they they actually may not be reduced adequately so if i am not able to get a stable reduction good enough for early mobilization then i'm i'm worried about the quality of my reduction itself so uh, i have almost never found the need to immobilize these for 3 weeks at 45 degrees flexion i would like to know the view of the rest of the panelists and then maybe you can have a final comment milin yes sir dr randy mabindra can contribute yeah you know the um, so the index and the small finger they generally are stable when it happens in the thumb it's unstable because both the collaterals are often ripped off so when i do thumbs i pin them uh but when i do the index finger etc they are allowed to rehab like a like a flexor tendon block so they're moving but they're not fully extending because the volar plate has been cut and so there is no block to hyperextension right uh milind i i normally tell people don't do a palmer approach because the risk of cutting the nerve is too high and where i am in a teaching hospital often the registrar is doing these cases so i just say you stay at the dorsal aspect you keep cutting till it gets reduced in the middle yes. and uh, and they never have trouble so i generally i see no benefit in doing a palmer approach whenever i've done it it's only been to demonstrate to somebody or if they've asked me to do it in particular but i have found no benefit there is nothing you repair or do differently you know uh so i normally only teach people to do dorsal but i think volar is good just the uh, what i have been told is when you do volar for the first half the skin is a digital so uh, so is there any incidence of late instability because of volar plate splitting in the dorsal approach no okay scar down this scar down well yeah yeah uh dr binda i i missed your comment because of some audio disturbance but then uh, i am now tempted to do a dorsal approach which i have never done till date <laughs> somehow oh is that right okay <laughs> i i have always been doing i i think it it, uh, it it's it's what i was exposed to during my training days and so that has stuck with me and i'm 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 inclined to do volar approach and uh, my my fear always has been to touch the extensor uh, apparatus which which essentially is un, uninvolved in this injury and 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 the philosophy that the 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 flexor aspect is uh, will take the surgical insults much better than the extensor apparatus uh, which will be split which otherwise is virgin otherwise and also yeah. the belief that 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 entire uh, that that an intact extensor hood actually uh, might act as a soft tissue hinge and allow me good mobilization so that that has been the 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 apprehension and uh, the the thought process so any any thoughts on that i mean are are my fears ill founded no i think i think you make valid points right whenever we can operate on the palm much better there is no extensor repair to protect and uh, yeah. and the scar heals better scar is hidden but i think the safety of the approach to me 
uh, is more important. So I know with the docile approach, the nothing, absolutely nothing goes wrong. I think where people get fooled on the docile approach is they don't know where the volar plate is because the volar plate looks like the metacarpal Cartilage. head. It is, right. it is so tightly stretched. It looks like the metacarpal head. And you're wondering, where is this volar plate? And then you have to cut you have to cut this thing that looks like cartilage on the metacarpal head. And the moment you cut it, it becomes clear that it's the volar plate. It's yes. extremely tight. It's like a drum. It's stretched like a drum. So it looks like the cartilage. It's white, you know, and you're scared to cut it. But if you keep cutting it, you just get down to bone and it drops back very easily. So, yes. Dr. Yeah. Pankaj, if there is an osteochondral fragment, you have to go dorsally only. Then how, how you have been managing these cases? Like if there is a chondral fragment, because it is on the dorsal side. So yeah, you said you are doing holer only. Yeah, yeah okay. fortunately, uh, I have had only one case of an osteochondral fragment, which was uh, accompanied uh, by a dislocation, which was a initially operated dislocation. And yeah. it was a large chunk with the collateral ligament attached to it. Uh, the original, the index surgeon had missed it. And I, I discovered it only... Uh -huh. uh, when I operated this patient from the dorsal side, because there was already extensive volar scarring because of the earlier surgery. So I decided to go dorsal with a persistent dislocation. Yes, sir. And I found that this was a collateral, there was a large collateral uh, ligament uh, fragment. Other than that, I have, I have not had an instance of uh, uh, osteochondral fragment which needed fixation. Uh, however, I agree with you. If if I'm able to localize the osteochondral fragment preoperatively, then depending on the location of the fragment, I might decide to go dorsally. Right. And as I'm I'm listening to more and more presentations on this and experience, I think I must uh, give dorsal approach a go here on. Yes, sir. And one so, question to Dr. Andy, sir: When, sir, it is a neglected uh, metacarpophalangeal, do you prefer to go holer or dorsal? When it is like say, again one and a half, two months or three months old. So again, it would be dorsal because in that case, the dorsal capsule will be tight, correct? Because it's dorsally dislocated. Your yes. collateral ligaments will be tight and they will need to be released, which again will need a dorsal approach. So uh, to me, it would still end up being, and if, if it is really, really tight, I have to put an external fixator and stretch it or anything like that. Everything is conducive from the dorsal aspect. If the cartilage is damaged and I decide to replace the joint, again, it would be dorsal. So dorsal approach will give, give me the best approach for doing everything that I need to do. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Bindra. Thanks, Milin. Thank I you, sir. That, Thank that made for a very good discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, it's, it's now my pleasure to invite uh, my colleague, uh, my friend, Dr. Rohan. Uh, he's going to speak to us about uh, terrible triad of the elbow. Uh, the reason for selecting this topic also was, uh, though, though it's a very well-described entity, uh, it's, it's not very often that people document this as a triad in their clinical practice. Very often the components of this injury get treated individually without realizing that they're actually part of a triad and that's where things start going wrong. And me and Rohan had a bit of discussion on this, whether it's a good topic to discuss here. Uh, Rohan, uh, as I told, is a, is a trained arthroscopist, has worked in the US for more than a couple of years, uh, has done his fellowship in hand surgery from Ganga Hospital, and he will take us through terrible triad of elbow. Over to you, Rohan. Uh, Pankaj, thank you. Uh, you can hear me? Yes, yes, Rohan, you, we can hear you, we can see your presentation. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Multha, uh, Dr. Pankaj, and the Mumbai Suburban Orthopedic Society for this opportunity. Uh, we'll talk about the terrible triad of the elbow and we'll try and simplify it today. The objectives of this talk would be how to evaluate, how to manage, and have no disclosures uh, with the current talk. When you say triad, it is classically described as three components. The first component is elbow dislocation. The second one is a possible coronoid fracture. And the third component is a radial head fracture. So uh, these are the three things that uh, a terrible triad of the elbow was described. 
And as we learned more and more about this pathology, there were other components that were either changed or the same components were modified. And we'll go through, through it one by one. Whenever you see a terrible triad or an elbow dislocation with some fracture associated, or immediately think of three columns. The lateral column would be the radial head, the lateral and collateral ligament, and the common extensor origin. So it will be in this area. The anterior component or the anterior column would be the coronoid and the capsule. So it would be the coronoid and the capsule. And the medial column would be the medial collateral ligament. That would be the anterior band of the medial collateral ligament. And it's quite close to the coronoid process. And the importance of which we'll talk about it in a bit. So for me, whenever I manage a terrible triad, I would always look at these three columns and assess them one after the other. So why is terrible triad uh, so important? Honestly, it's a very uncommon injury. Over six or seven years, uh, our data showed we just had about 22 cases amongst many elbow dislocations that everybody sees. However, because elbow dislocation, a simple elbow dislocation is so common, I think a terrible triad could be missed. For example, in this scenario, the concerned surgeon thought this was an elbow dislocation, reduced it, and tried to pin it because he was unable to keep it stable. And the right side x-rays are at about one year from the day of surgery. So the terrible triad is missed because we, we have an incomplete clinical assessment. That's what probably happened because the surgeon would not have looked at the stability of the elbow after reduction. There would probably be incomplete imaging and probably an inadequate surgery. The consequences of missed terrible triad are quite bad. For example, in this case, this is a significant osteoarthritic elbow in a young patient. You have unstable elbows, you have arthritic elbows, and you have stiff elbows. So it's essential that we don't miss a terrible triad. Remember the three columns. So the anterior column would, is primarily the coronoid. So in sometimes after you reduce the elbow dislocation, you may not see a coronoid fracture. So don't say that this is a simple dislocation. Even if you don't see a coronoid fracture, it could mean the second component is injured. That's the anterior capsule. It could be either avulsed or it could either be ruptured. Commonly, you see a coronoid which is like this, you know, it's comminuted or there could be a big piece. Here, yes, we are definitely alarmed that something is wrong with the elbow. It's this picture that concerns me because this is the picture that could probably fool a surgeon in doing something uh, differently. On the radial side, the lateral side, you can have a, a radial head fracture, which is quite common. It could be a comminuted fracture like this, or it could be a neck fracture like this. Again, don't be fooled by this image. Whenever you see a fracture around the elbow, start thinking about, am I looking at a terrible triad? And we will see how we can assess it. So this is the common sequence that happens. You see a picture like this in the clinic or in the ER, then you kind of do your close manipulation and you end up getting the elbow back, all right? And this is a fairly common sequence and everybody knows how to reduce the elbow. For me, if I find it easy to reduce, like if the elbow just flops back in place, it can very easily flop back out. So for me, how I reduce the elbow, whether it was a little tough or whether there was a clunk of reduction, immediately puts up my antennas on whether this is a terrible try. So the ease of reduction should be your first guide. Now, Everybody knows you have reduced this dislocation, looks quite simple, innocuous, you have reduced it, and then you have put it in a splint and you've gotten an X-ray. Look at this X-ray first. You know, you draw a radial axis through the radial neck and it bisects the capital M. So I know that the radial head is aligned with the capital M. If you look at the ulno humeral joint, it's fairly congruent. Now look at this X-ray. I'm going to draw a radial axis and it is falling behind the capital M and there is slight widening of the ulnohumeral joint. So now I know, despite having a reduction of the elbow, the joint doesn't look good and this should immediately be a red flag of whether this is an elbow which is unstable. Look at this position. This is 90 degree elbow position and still the elbow is, is subluxated. 
So the first thing was the ease of reduction. The second thing was anything with the X-ray after reduction. So you have reduced the elbow. The second thing important thing is to check for stability. And the stability could be checked with the patient in the lying down position and ask the patient to flex and then gently extend. If the elbow seems to dislocate or subluxate out, even before it reaches a 30 degree extension, it's a significantly unstable elbow and, it need, and we need to do something about it. The next step would be to give an above elbow plaster for immobilization. I usually do it at 90 degrees in flexion and in pronation of uh, the forearm. X-rays in the plaster are important, like we discussed earlier. For any elbow which I find or suspect to be unstable, I would always do a CT scan. You know, it, it's quite essential because you might pick up a slight subluxation of the elbow, which we may not see on an X-ray. This is, an, this is a, an obvious dislocation, but you could see a small subluxation. You could also see a small chip fractures of the coronoid which you may not see on an X-ray. And again, that's the fourth red flag, knowing that this, could, this is an unstable pattern. The other thing that you could do see on a CT scan is how far is your coronoid retracted? This can tell you that you might have difficulty in reducing this piece back. You can also pick up some other innocuous fractures of the radial head, which we might miss, and we may end up treating an unstable elbow. So when you have a simple dislocation, how do you differentiate from a terrible try? So we talked about the ease of reduction. We talked about the stable arc. So if you have a dislocation which you have reduced and the patient had a stable arc from 30 to 130, then probably this is a simple dislocation and doesn't need any intervention. Most of the simple dislocations won't have fracture or they may have just a minor fracture, something like this. But when you have a picture like this, don't ever leave the patient alone because the, the results after non-operative management of a terrible triad are very poor and this has been documented in the literature. So now we have an unstable elbow. Go back to your three columns, the anterior, lateral, and the medial column. And this is how I would look at it. The anterior column has a coronoid. So if I don't see a fracture on the CD scan, but the elbow is unstable, I would know that it's the capsule that, which, is, which is affected. So I would need some good sutures or I would need some suture anchors. Now in the X-ray or in the CD scan, if I see a small chip of coronoid and the elbow is unstable, I would again need some suture or suture anchors. However, if you have a very large piece of coronoid, something like this, then I need some screws or some plates. So this is my armamentarium for fixing the anterior uh, column or in a terrible trial. On the lateral side, if I see a radial head and which I feel I can fix, then I would either need screws or plate. So in a fracture like this, probably a plate would be essential. Or if I feel the radial head is comminuted, I would need a radial head replacement prosthesis. So for my lateral side, I need to keep a basic screws radial head plates and a radial head prosthesis uh, on my operative table. On the medial side, almost always you need sutures or suture anchors. Now, you have decided that you're going to, this is a terrible triad and you need to stabilize this. So what is the sequence? There is always a toss up between the fixing the anterior versus fixing the lateral column first. And where I trained and what I practice is this. I always try and get the anterior column fixed first. That means either the capsule, anterior capsule or the coronoid. I approach this via a lateral approach or if needed a medial approach, we'll talk about it in a bit. Once I have fixed the anterior column, I would then look at the lateral column. So either fix the radial head or replace the radial head. And the third would be the medial column. Whether to fix it or not, we will discuss it in a moment. For me, the first incision is always the lateral incision. And that's the simple, straightforward cocos approach. Uh, for this picture, I thank Dr. Prashant Bhandari from Pune. This was a very nice uh, picture of the uh, lateral approach. Everybody does a radial head fixation. It's a similar approach. Ideally, you would see a specific plane because of the hematoma or the rupture of the capsule. So it's very easy to dissect. Once I get to the radial head, this is where the plan may change, okay? I'm still trying to fix the anterior column, okay? So if I go through the lateral approach, 
I look at the radial head first. If I find the radial head too comminuted, okay, so I know I'm going to replace it. So I will re remove all the comminuted pieces. I'll continue with the lateral approach and I would fix the anterior capsule or if there is a small chip uh, of the coronoid attached to the anterior capsule through the lateral approach itself, okay? If I find the radial head comminuted, I'm going to remove it and replace it, but I find a very large piece of coronoid, which I think will need screws or plates, then I'm going to go to the medial side, go through the two heads of the FCU and fix the coronoid from the front. So again, whether I go from the lateral or the medial side, we would always fix the anterior column first. Now, I have, we have opened up the lateral side. We find the radial head to be intact. So it's fixable. Now, since the radial head is fixable, you will not be able to approach the coronoid through here. So the radial head is fixable. So you will not be able to approach the coronoid or the anterior capsule through here. In this scenario, you need to open, make an incision on the medial side, go ahead, approach the coronoid from the other side. Now, coronoid, if it's a large fragment, then you could end up fixing it with a plate like this. Occasionally, you would end up fixing with screws like this. If it's a small chip, or if it's, there is, there's no coronoid fracture, but there is a uh, capsular revulsion, then we end up fixing with sutures. Uh, I've used only once or twice, I've used anchors, but primarily we use uh, pull-out sutures. We take good bites through the anterior capsule, drill holes through the ulna, and then pull it back. And then we go ahead and replace the radial head. On the lateral side, the, the decision is quite easy. So once you have fixed the anterior column, the capsule or the coronoid, you can either fix the radial head. In our series, we have done 11 fixations, or you could end up replacing the radial head, something like this. We have done about 11 patients. Again, for this particular radial head replacement slide, I would like to thank Dr. Prashant Bandari from Pune. Once you have replaced the radial head, you can always repair, you have to always repair the lateral and collateral ligament complex. And if the common extensor origin is avulsed, you need to put it back. Now you've fixed the anterior column, you've fixed the lateral side. Now you assess the anterior posterior stability again and you range the elbow on table from 30 to 130. In this, after fixing these two, if you still find the elbow subluxating or dislocating, that is the time when you need to do the medial repair. You know, this will be a picture that you will probably see when you do a C arm imaging. You can see the radial head is behind the capitulum and there is a wide ulnohumeral gap. So this is the time I would go on the medial side and I would repair the medial collateral ligament. In our series of five, we have ended up fixing only five of them. The medial approach is quite easy. You just have to take care of the ulnar nerve. From the same medial approach, you could fix the coronoid as well as you could fix the uh, medial collateral ligament. Once you have fixed all three structures or the two structures, you close up. And this is what we follow in our practice. We immobilize the patient in an above elbow slab for two weeks. And beyond that, depending upon how compliant the patient is, we would end up giving him a sling or a splint. We start the range of movement at one week. We allow the swelling and any pain to settle down. We allow the, allow the flexion from 90 degrees to the mouth, so 90 to further flexion. At one week mark, we, can, we break the slab and allow 80 to further flexion and so on. But by two weeks, we have removed this uh, plaster and then we would gradually increase 10 degrees every week so that the patient gets to extension by about uh, eight weeks. Uh, if you look at the books, a hinge knee brace is actually better, but I have no experience with a hinge knee brace. So these are our outcomes. Uh, the outcomes are not perfect because this is a difficult scenario. We had about 22 patients only over the last seven years. Uh, if you look at it, all, there was a fixed flexion deformity of 20 degrees in almost all the patients. So you end up having some deformity uh, because of maybe the anterior capsular scarring. Most of them end up getting a good range of function. Be, be alert, you may end up having a restriction of pronosopination, but this is again within the functional range of movement. We had two patients, despite repairing all three structures, still were subluxated at one week x-ray. 
what we did in those patients were we continued immobilization in about 100 degree fraction for about four weeks and then started our extension protocol. Uh, Pankaj. Yeah, Rohan. Yeah, so uh, yeah. I, I'm going to share a case and this was our, my perspective of a terrible triad. I would like to involve the faculty and sure. get their opinions of how they would go ahead and is that okay I'll, i can ask uh, the senior faculty yeah yeah yeah, yeah. You, okay. you 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 can involve uh, gautam's experience as well okay so uh, firstly then i'll ask gautam this was a 53 year old male had a non dominant hand injury post fall this was the left elbow it was a closed injury and the neurovascular examination was normal so how would you proceed with this so it's currently out of the joint Yes. So it needs to go back. That's okay. the first thing. So it goes back in. I, as, as you've mentioned, even I look at how easily it goes back in. And generally these, once you have more than one uh, column injured, it, it just goes back in. It's, okay. It's a, it's a doddle really. Okay. And then I put them in, put a plaster. I always go at hundred. I, I don't go at 90. I just find it too risky. And then I'll send them for a CT. Okay, so we did a close reduction. It actually went back in easy. And this was uh, reduced. We looked at the stability and the, the elbow was going out at 60 degrees when we ranged the elbow. So we have given an above elbow plaster at about 90 degrees. Uh, Dr. Mutha, how would you proceed with this? <laughs> means what your, what's your take? Means when you see such patients, what, what's your perspective about going ahead with this? Uh, what is his age? I forget. He's 53. Uh, depending on what the CT shows, if the CT shows that the radial head is fixable, uh, we'll go ahead with fixing the radius, SOS replacement. And uh, after having fixed or replaced on table, uh, we can assess intraoperatively about the medial lateral instability. And then decide whether to open the collateral right away and fix it or just immobilize for some time, maybe with a hinge elbow brace or something and uh, get yeah. it stable. Okay. Yeah, uh, Rohan. Pankaj, um, yes. Yeah, Rohan, when you see preoperatively an x ray like this, hmm. uh, I, I'm more and more convinced that uh, radial head replacement might be a better choice than radial head fixation. Uh, having said that, it also means that I'm more and more convinced that radial head excision in these uh, cases of terrible triad is not an option. So how far do you agree with what I am learning now? Okay, so uh, that's I've written in a summary, but I'll, let me put it here. If you have an elbow dislocation, with a radial head fracture, the take home point is, is never do a radial head excision. Means almost always you will end up with an unstable elbow. Okay, I'm talking about 99% of the cases. Either you fix the radial head or you replace the radial head. That means you give back the lateral column stability. And that's what uh, my learning has been wherever I've trained. So this patient was unstable. So we ended up doing only the medial side. It was a comminuted radial head. We put sutures here. It was a capsular rupture. So we didn't need an anchor. We repaired the lateral head, uh, sorry, the anterior capsule, replaced it, and it was stable. So we did not end up going on the medial side. And this is his range of motion at about six months. So if you see, he has a fixed flexion deformity of about 20 degrees, goes to about 140 degrees of flexion. So... Now, so uh, Dr. Bindra, if you're around, do you advise an MRI for ruling out a terrible triad injury or an X-ray and a CT scan is enough? This is a clinical diagnosis, right? And radiographic. So with the history of the dislocation and the radial head fracture, then the CT scan will tell you if there is a coronoid fracture or not. And to me, the key element is, is uh, fixing the coronoid if it's there. I usually use a, a pull-through type suture. 
and replace the radial head. I find fixing radial heads makes them very stiff. So I only do it if they are young people in their 20s and stuff. And uh, MRI is of benefit. I mean, if they're very unstable. So, you know, in our center, we only do lateral approach. uh, And uh, even for the coronoid. So you fix the coronoid before you replace the radial head. So you get good view right across. And then uh, if the medial side is torn, I would just put an external fixator. While you were speaking there, I was just pulling up uh, an article by Orbe. So those of you who don't have an external fixator available or you don't have uh, anything exotic, uh, I'll just share my screen here. I've got this uh, paper opened up here somewhere. Uh, One second. Could I stop? Should I stop sharing? One second. So here's this article from Orhe Orbe. He now makes he now makes a um, he now has a commercial one that he sells. But if you pull up this article, he talks of a clever way of putting one wire inside the elbow and one wire into the olecranon. And by twisting the wires to each other, you can get a stable joint, and then you can pull out the wires after six weeks, and then the patient can mobilize again. So I just wanted to okay. bring that paper to your attention. It's a very nice technique of making an internal fixator using two K wires. Okay. Uh, since we are on the topic where you said you don't open on the medial side, what if you are in a scenario? Again, these are five common questions that I've been asked. So that's why I've put them up. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you approach? Uh, uh, Ro- 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 Rohan, just, just a moment before you go ahead. Yes, uh, Professor Bindra, could, could you just copy the link of that article? and paste it yeah. in the chat box. I will share with the audience so they can, they can, they can see it at a later date. Uh, sorry, Good sorry, idea. Rohan, I interrupted okay. you. you. Please go ahead. I'll just continue with Dr. Bindra because he said they open lateral side. Dr. Bindra, when you, if you have a situation where the radial head is fixable, are you still able to fix the coronoid despite not removing the radial head from the in situ position? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, the coronoid in this, in this pattern usually is a tip fracture. Right, oh, it's yes. not the anterior medial coronoid. The anterior medial coronoid is a different fracture pattern. Those are approached medially, and I put a plate on it. Right. Okay. These yes. coronoids are largely a tip. Now, sometimes a coronoid is large, and it's actually split across, and it's a proximal ulna fracture. Okay. Right. Yes. In those cases, it's a big posterior incision, and then it's a approach. coronoid and then right so okay. say in the majority of instances it is doable from the lateral side it's certainly easier when the head is broken but even if the head is not broken the thing the trick is not to the trick is to re-dislocate the elbow or subluxate it put my drill holes through the ulna coming out of the fracture right okay. with the acl guide put okay. the suture loop around the coronoid capturing some of the anterior capsule pull the suture through the back hmm. but okay. don't tie it yet Reduce the elbow, fix the radial head, and tie the olecranon down at the very end. Okay, that's a so nice. That's the kind of that's the way to do it. Yeah, that's a nice trick, uh, Pankaj. The other question that we I get is: suppose you have a comminuted radial head, but the surgeon has failed to keep a prosthesis available. Do you have any tips of how to proceed with this? I, I would, in that case, fix the radial head to the best of my ability. However, whether I replace or whether I would fix, I would I would have spoken to the patient about having to do something to the radial head six months down the line. So even if I, I replace, I, I'm, I'm prepared to take them out at six six months because I'm, I'm never sure about the use of correct size of the radial head. More often than not, I land up uh, overstuffing the joint. And it's, it's, it's quite common for patients to have trouble with the radial head rather than any other component of the terrible triad. So uh, I, I'm not really looking at a great outcome of the radial head fracture itself, whether it is replaced or uh, fixed. The, I just want to maintain that column to correct length until the rest of the ligament injury has healed. And th- th- then I would not hesitate taking up the radial head at a later date. Okay, uh, Gautam, one last question to you. Uh, you have repaired all three columns, but you find the elbow is still subluxating. Do you have any tip or trick of how to go ahead with this? So, so 
I do it maybe slightly differently, but you constantly should EUA the elbow whilst you're repairing it. Okay. So if your repair is good, it should not sublux. However, because there's an issue with sizing in India, so we okay. don't get the correct size radial head, we end up overstuffing it. So I tend to choose a smaller size than what actually goes in. So under, under uh, stuff the radial head. Okay. So you would see that when you extend the elbow beyond 30, you would okay. see an element of incongruity. Okay. However, as soon as you go beyond 30, 35, and then go up to 100, you'll see congruity. I think that is, I am happy with that kind of congruity because I'm going to keep them in a cast for about roughly about 10 days till the wounds heal or 14 days and then put them on the splint that you showed second one, okay. the hinge, hinge elbow brace. Okay, thanks Gautam. Uh, Dr. Muta, you wanted to comment? I have a question, a question from a general orthopedician's point of view. Uh, I have been always been taught that in a dislocation with a radial head fracture, we need to fix or, uh, re or put a radial head prosthesis and then do uh, whatever to the ligament on its merits. Now, this is something I learned in the lockdown period. In the beginning of the lockdown, I had two cases of elbow dislocation back to back. It's a comminuted radial head. One of them was fixable. In fact, I have discussed it with Pankaj also. And we decided to fix SOS, replace, uh, and then repair the ligament. Now, both these patients could not be operated because of COVID. So they were put into a slab and then they lost to follow up, they mobilized. And I have seen both of them around two, two and a half months later. They have reasonably good range of motion. There is pain at the end. The instability which I could feel at the outset was not there. And of course, the radial head was where it was. So now I wanted to ask you one thing. In such a situation, when you have a dislocation with a comminuted radial head, is just holding on for six to eight weeks and doing a delayed excision at six weeks instead of fixing or replacing an option at all? Uh, okay. So if you, if you go back to my first uh, red flag, so when you have the ease of dislocation, if you think it's easy or if you have reduced the dislocation, you need to range it, okay? It, probably both these patients that you had, when you could, if they could flex and then gently extend, I'm sure they could have, they would have been able to extend beyond 30 degrees or at least up to 30 degrees without no, the elbow no, subluxating. No, no, no. Because but they were unstable beyond 40, 45. Okay, so yeah. most of these patients who 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 are unstable would probably start dislocating at 40 or maybe earlier, even at 60, sometimes at 90 degree elbow slab, you would see a subluxated elbow. In, in your case, I would still go ahead and fix it early rather than late. I'm not talking about from my experience. The literature does say that the, the, the results of an unstable elbow managed a little later is quite worse. You know, these two could be an exception as compared to the rule. But by rule, I think you should always evaluate the elbow. And if you find it unstable between the 30 to 130 range, you should, you should give them the best possible chance, especially in young patients. So delayed excision is not an option at all? Is not an option because here primarily the, uh, you, the, the radial head has healed. If you're going to excise the radial head, the indication at three months would be different. That indication will, will not be stability. Okay. The, indi yeah, the indication would be pain or maybe rot restriction of chronosupination. So the indications would be different. Uh, Rohan, you can stop sharing your screen while you discuss. Yeah, Satish, the, the, the issue that you discuss, if, if this was indeed a terrible triad in both cases, then perhaps the outcome may not be as good as you said. However, if there was no significant injury on the... Uh, medial ulnar collateral ligament, uh, uh, ulnar humeral ligament, then perhaps with the uh, radial head fracture, which was untreated and which is not uh, coming in the way of uh, uh, the elbow flexion extension arc, you, you could 
in fact delay the excision of the radial head i i see no problem with that uh however if there was indeed a significant medial uh, ligament injury then a uh, radial head which is untreated would hamper the healing of the soft tissues on the medial side and then the outcome may not be as good this is my take on this uh, i i so what is significant excision. sorry what is significant medial collateral injury i mean are there any so, so, clinical so, so, radiological guidelines so 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 it it is an indirect assessment if your elbow is stable through the functional arc you know that the the medial uh, ligament injury is uh, is it's no, it may not be a complete avulsion however if your uh, elbow is not stable through the functional arc you should suspect uh, medial ligament injury of course there are other telltale signs bruising on the medial side significant tenderness on the medial side uh, yes if 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 the radiologist is well versed with an mri of a elbow in acute trauma setting then you could rely on their uh, uh, finding of a medial uh, ligament complex which appears wavy rather than straight pulled out on the mri images i think i think but not all radiologists will be very well versed with mri of an elbow in acute trauma setting so that should that that reporting you could take a take a with a pinch of salt yeah okay thanks pankaj thank thanks rohan that was wonderful uh, terrible triad is is a is a topic for an entire day by itself but i think this could this could be a good beginning for for many of us uh that brings us to uh, the last speaker of the session uh, dr gautam tauri he is going to speak to us about uh, a problem which we uh, love to overlook the malunited distal radius fracture we can always dig out innumerable references to justify any amount of malunion of the distal radius there is plenty that is written on distal radius fracture in fact the the majority of the articles the most cited 50 articles in hand surgery in last 20, 25 years if there is one single topic which has attracted maximum articles is the distal radius fracture uh, gautam over to you yeah so i'm having a little of a technical issue now uh, i might have to quit and come back no problem no problem uh me- meanwhile uh, we-, we 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 could have uh, are there any questions for any of the faculty from anybody yeah you you, you can you can ask questions to each other i have a question for dr rohan yeah mili yeah so like you said the cocker's interval you develop i mean you go through the cocker's interval is it really necessary to find the interval because already the fracture plane the plane has been dissected by the hematoma and i think the cocker is a little uh, more risky for as far as the lateral collateral ligament is concerned we can go through the kaplan or maybe edc splitting also so do you really look for the uh, interval or you just go through the whatever the nature has given you the in, because of the fracture hematoma, hematoma itself rohan is it for yeah okay hi yeah, so know. you're right so i did i did mention it it's actually the the skin incision then the deep fascia and most of the times almost always you would have a good plane through which you can easily go in don't make a new plane oh, yeah, yeah. just in case there is there is no plane that that you find that is the only time i would use a cocus because it gives me a good area for or a good exposure to fix the radial head you can extend it proximally and look at the lateral ulnar collateral ligament as well as if at all there is an avulsion of the common extensor origin you could you could go it go through there uh one thing which i learned from dr bindra is try and subluxate the elbow make the two holes pass the sutures for the anterior capsule and tie it later because i'm always worried uh, of doing a coronoid from the from the lateral side if the radial head is intact so i think that's for me that was a good take home point you know rohan i i, I do the common extensor the split approach the direct lateral uh, approach okay. and i get uh, i think people struggle to look at the front of the elbow the trick is to extend the incision above 
and to take off the ECRL origin of the humerus. When you do that, right, and you put a, put a retractor all the way across to the medial side, you put a bone lever and you lift up that homan, you get a full anterior view of the elbow. So the secret is not, is not to extend distally to get more exposure, but to go proximally and you get more. Yeah, it's funny, right? You always think I have to open more distally and then everybody's nervous about the posterior interosseous nerve. But if you go proximally, and you can afford to go another five centimeters proximally and elevate, and you don't have to worry about the radial nerve. If you have the elbow flexed, you'll get a nice view and you can see the whole radial head and you can see the coronoid and everything quite well. Thank so, you, sir. So, so in effect, in effect, pushing uh, the anterior and lateral part through the interval between ECR and ECRD. Is, is yeah, that what you're you doing a lateral yeah. column you're doing the lateral column approach that you use for elbow release, right? The yes, absolutely. Approach. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That, that, I, I think it was worth the Sunday morning for that one, one tip. <laughs> Thank you very much. Gautam, uh, your computer is behaving itself. No? Yes. I think I had an issue with sharing the screen. So it would ask me to uh, get out of the uh, meeting and then come back to share the okay. screen. Okay. Okay. I think weird, I, we, we, yeah, we are, we are good now. Go ahead. Right. So I think it's thank you, Pankaj. And it was good to listen to so many speakers uh, with my two pence of contribution to whatever it can be. Uh, I'm trying to talk on malunited distal and radius fracture. Uh, it's a complex topic and there is huge amount of stuff that can be talked about. However, I'm going to try and keep it basic, general and simple. Uh, so let me, how do I, yeah, yeah, please, perfect. So distal and radius fracture, one of the most commonest fracture that we see, uh, forms about 12 to 15% of all the fractures that we see in our day-to-day -day routine trauma practice. There are multiple classifications for distal radius fracture, so I'm not going to dwell into uh, each one of them and. Uh, how they can be used or not used for uh, treatment. However, for me, simple things are simple. So I keep them as extra-articular, intra-articular because it determines in my head uh, what I need to do next uh, for them. So treatment-wise, very simple. We either keep it conservative or we do an operation. Conservative generally is close reduction or uh, without close reduction casting, whichever is uh, going to give us a decent alignment. Operative goes across from uh, manipulation and uh, KY fixation to open reduction internal fixation with all the new devices that we have now got. However, uh, we do get complications and the commonest complication is a malunion, which is what I'm going to uh, try and see if we can help. So. In terms of distal and radius malunion, we need to determine what a malunion is. And to determine what a malunion is, we need parameters. So what is an unacceptable parameter? So these are the normal angles of uh, a distal radius. So we have a radial inclination of 22 degrees. We have a volar tilt of uh, 11 degrees and another variance of about two millimeters. So an unacceptable parameter across the literature is that the radial inclination, if is less than 10 degrees, uh, is going to cause probably some problem. If we have a volar tilt or a dorsal tilt of uh, about more than 20 degrees, which essentially means that if you're starting from 10 degrees volar and going 20 degrees dorsal, we're actually going 30 degrees dorsal. Uh, so we hope or we think that this is going to cause some problem. If we lose radial height by a centimeter, then yes, we're going to uh, probably get some problem. If we have an ulnar variance for of more than two millimeters, then we might have some problem. And if indeed the fracture is intra-articular and the gap is more than two millimeters, then uh, we might have problems. And this is probably right for most joints uh, in the body. We don't accept any gaps or steps of more than two millimeters. 
in the articular fractures. However, do they make a functional difference? Yes, there's a, there's a paper that has come up from uh, Sweden, which is a longitud longitudinal study of about 14 years on malreduced uh, or uh, reduced and malunited fractures. And they say that if you have a radial inclination of less than 15 degrees, if you have a dorsal tilt of more than 10 degrees, and if you have an ulnar variance of more than three millimeters, you will be able to corroborate that on a DASH score, saying that there is a functional disturbance to the patients. Now, this study is essentially done between 18 to 65 years of age group. So it is, it is in the young patients, okay? So that takes us to what happens if we have a malunion. So there are biomechanical alterations that happen when we have a malunion. What if we lose uh, radial inclination? So if we lose radial inclination, it alters our flexor tendon functions because it alters the length, as a result of which it alters our grip. If we lose our DRUJ, we lose our uh, load transmission and we lose our rotations. If we lose the dorsal tilt, then we have increased load happening onto the ulna, or, and the dorsal force increases onto the distal ulna, then causing uh, problems. So these result into some kind of functional changes. Uh, functional changes are very subjective and we cannot correlate them based on radiological features. Malunion can result in arthritis over a long period of time at the distal radial ulnar joint or indeed at the radiocarpal joints, uh, especially if uh, the fracture is intraarticular, it will affect the radiocarpal joint. This is what we get in long run. So we can get a, a dizzy deformity if uh, we have a dorsally angulated uh, distal radius malunited fracture. And in long run, we might get a non-dissociated carpal instability. But the, the, the picture actually uh, shows uh, quite convincingly why the scaphoid flexes and why the lunate extends. It is needless for me to uh, tell you about articular uh, incongruity because articular incongruity should not be accepted and uh, should not be treated lightly because it has significant consequences and that is across the literature. So who gets malunion? So it's, it's quite interesting. I came across literatures and there, there are some interesting facts. So what if we treat our fractures closed, which is what happens a lot and in, increasingly more during this lockdown time. So with cast immobilization, we have a 24% risk of getting a malunion. That is, if I treat four patients in cast, one will come back with a malunion. With operative, we have an 11% risk of uh, malunion. Now, these operations are uh, both closed reduction internal fixation and open reduction internal fixation. So out of the 4%, after the 11%, 4% is essentially due to internal fixation. And uh, there are reasons for that. Do clinical severity equate to is equitable to bony deformity? I don't think because it is a lot dependent on uh, age factor, the function factor of the hand and uh, the attitude or the mindset of the patient. So you might have a good old elderly lady with a malunited fracture happily going across and not causing any problems. So I don't think clinical severity should be related to the bony deformity that we get. So how do they, they present? So they present to us either symptomatic or asymptomatic, which means in our normal follow-up, after we've treated uh, patients in cast or with uh, surgical intervention, at uh, follow-up, we find that yes, the surgical intervention has been just short of adequate or uh, indeed adequate, but things have displaced, but they are not symptomatic. Uh, on the other side, we might have a perfectly good uh, reduction, but they become symptomatic as things do uh, tend to take a 
turn in terms of collapse uh, over a period of six weeks if treated conservatively. And that is difficult to predict. What do we do? We, we normally need radiographs. So two radiographs, two orthogonal views uh, to determine where the malunion lies and what uh, components are involved in the malunion. A CT is almost always required if you are indeed looking at doing a uh, interventive treatment. Uh, definitely required if you're doing a intraoperate, uh, intra treating an intraarticular fracture. MRI scans, I, I don't tend to use them a lot, uh, but in the odd patients where you do get soft tissue issues across the lateral side of the ulna, the, essentially a TFCC tear and things like that, then you need to uh, get an MRI scan to confirm the uh, degree and the uh, intensity of the TFCC tear. So how do we treat them? So we need to plan them because uh, once we have decided that the malunion is actually symptomatic and the patient is intending to go ahead and wants to sort these symptoms out, then we need to plan the malunion. So we need to determine, based on our CT and X's, we need to determine what things have gone wrong and what can we correct. We need to time our surgery well. Uh, timing changes uh, with perspective. However, the sooner, the better because uh, the callus is fresh, uh, the recovery is faster. If you uh, break on a forming callus and redirect the fragments in the way they should be. Uh, up to 14 weeks is probably a decent time to uh, intervene. If you have agreed between you and the patient that you need to intervene for the malunion, uh, the results are good up to 14 weeks. Uh, beyond 14 weeks, uh, the results are not as good as what you see be before 14 weeks, but certainly better than what the patient comes to you with. So uh, certainly there is merit in addressing the malunion, but your prognosis go becomes a little bit more guarded as uh, time passes by. So what are our surgical goals? So when we are actually aiming to treat a malunion, we need to be looking at reorienting the articular surface if it's an intra-articular fracture or an extra-articular fracture. Uh, in terms of reorienting, we need to try and correct the inclination. We need to try and correct the tilt and the height as best as actually possible. Uh, we need to re-establish the wrist kinematics uh, to improve the wrist function. We need to try and restore the normal load and we need to try and restore the DRUJ function. So if you address them systematically, taking care of these factors, you're likely to get a, a, a palatable outcome or a good outcome, whichever, depending upon how bad the uh, malunion is. So what are our strategies? If we are going to treat them, how are we going to treat them? So we need to determine what the problem is. Is it an extra articular malunion? or an intra-articular malunion. So if you have an extra-articular malunion, we then need to determine whether conservative management is worth. Do we need to operate on this patient? And if we do agree, then what uh, we need to do? In terms of intra-articular malunion, I don't think there is much uh, to kind of defend yourself because if, if it's an intraarticular and the patient's symptomatic, then I don't think you have a lot of choice left. Uh, the reason why you get an intraarticular malunion is probably because either it was an intraarticular unstable fracture missed at the time, or it was an insufficient reduction following uh, an open reduction internal fixation. And that, that kind of really sums up why you need to do it. Or otherwise, it's a combined malunion. So it has an intra-articular component and an extra-articular component. And they are uh, quite difficult and challenging to treat. So in terms of extra-articular malunion, what do we get? So we get commonly 
the dorsally angulated malunion. This is one of the most commonest malunion. Treatment is classically described a dorsal approach. It requires an opening wedge osteotomy. It may or may not require a bone graft. The fixation uh, with a dorsal plate is definitely advantageous because you're on the tension surface of the wrist or the distal radius. And hence, uh, stability is much better mechanically. But you would get complications related to the extensor tendons. You would get complications related to the thickness of the hardware. Uh, however, with the new one, new uh, plates, this is less of an issue. Uh, but dorsal uh, tends to be causing uh, problems in terms of uh, tendons a lot more than volar. Uh, what is the other way of uh, treating extraarticular malunion, especially those who are, which are dorsally angulated? You can do a volar approach. Obviously, the reason why we are now edging more towards volar approach is because we've got fixed angle uh, volar plates. Again, the principle is same. You do an opening wedge osteotomy. However, fixation is through a fixed uh, angle plate. And uh, this gives good results. You might or might not have to use a bone graft. It gives you lesser tendon related issues, uh, but obviously you have to be careful with the uh, length of your pegs or your screws. Uh, but the stability, uh, the complications are largely stability related as it's on the volar surface. If you do not get adequate uh, contact on the bony, uh, volar cortex, uh, there is a lot of force on the plate. And there are incidences where the implants failed and, uh, or, and or the uh, reduction's been lost. With terms of intra-articular malunion, now this is uh, a lot more challenging, a lot more complex. It's, it's a completely different beast. Uh, you have to plan it to the nth level of execution that you can do. Uh, the more detailed it is, the better it is. Uh, it is, I mean, I can't, I can't for, uh, stress more on pre-op planning in these cases because they, they are very, very complex. Uh, you have to have an idea of how much joint damage has already happened because that will have a very important role to play in terms of a prognosis of the patient and also on uh, how you're going to counsel the patient. Uh, there are times when the joint damage has been a beyond uh, salvage, in which case you can't do a, a malunion corrective surgery. You have to talk patients into salvage operations. So one factor that determines which way you need to go is joint damage. The, the sooner you act uh, on an intraarticular fracture, the malunion of an intraarticular fracture, the faster, uh, the less chances you'll get a joint damage. Uh, with 3D planning, things have become definitely much easier and uh, uh, certainly improves your ability to tackle these complex issues. Uh, approach, again, it can be volar or dorsal, depending upon how the fragments are, or volar and dorsal. Uh, it can also be a, a, a lateral uh, or a radial approach, which allows you to take a decent bone graft, but it, it is really horses for courses for intraarticular malunions. Uh, there has been recent descriptions of arthroscopic techniques uh, to deal with this. Uh, the, the standard technique is outside in. Now the arthroscopic techniques uh, allow us to do inside out. Uh, again, it's, it's specialist surgery and uh, probably a lot more difficult than what meets the eye. Uh, combined malunion. So combined malunion, you're dealing with the intra-articular malunion. Which, is, which in itself is a problem, and you're dealing with an extra articular component. So it is probably one of the most challenging ones because you have multiplanar osteotomies to look at. Uh, 3D modeling helps in here, and uh, more uh, as we go into the uh, technologies, we are finding patient-specific cutting guides, and they, they are making life uh, easier for dealing with these. Uh, uh, there are also softwares that do a uh, virtual reduction for you to uh, kind of uh, understand how actual surgery might uh, possibly go. 
So coming on to complications, obviously the surgery is difficult. So there are going to be complications. Uh, there are papers that suggest the complication risk of around 40 to 50% if you deal with uh, complex intraarticular or indeed complex uh, distal end radius malunion surgeries. Uh, commonest complication, infection, and obviously non-union because you're re-breaking and rejoining. Implant failure, more commonly with a uh, volar approach as compared to dorsal approach. Uh, however, tendon injury seems to form about 20% of uh, the complication in uh, malunion surgeries. And they could be because of uh, either volar or dorsal, but uh, lack of understanding of where the uh, pegs or the screws are going and what tendons are getting irritated. Uh, the other problem obviously is the listus tubercle. And I think I think I don't need to emphasize more. This has been uh, run down to uh, death uh, when we talk about volar plating. Uh, uh, risk of nerve injury, loss of reduction, which I've mentioned, uh, but CRPS also should be remembered as these are uh, complex and big surgeries. So what, when do we do it or how do the patients present if they end up uh, having advanced problems? So they might have severe cartilage damage. Now that is an advanced presentation where you should be thinking twice before doing a malunion corrective uh, surgery. They might have degenerative changes, contractures uh, in the joint, uh, both soft tissue or capsular. Uh, there might be fixed malalignments. So if you have fixed malalignments, then it is it is quite difficult uh, to get a good outcome. And if you have complex fracture patterns. So in, in advanced presentations, one, need, one needs to be really uh, mindful that we can't treat everything and anything. Um, patients will present in advanced stage and we need to uh, look at salvage options. Uh, for these kind of patients. So these, these are kind of articular damage, uh, not really uh, reconstructible. So what salvage options do we have? So we have basic risk denervations because most patients complain of pain. We could do open or arthroscopic wrist arthrolysis to improve the range of movement. We could do partial fusions uh, to improve uh, function. We could do a, a total wrist fusion or indeed total wrist replacements. I don't think we have total wrist replacements in India yet, uh, but I'm sure uh, they are used uh, in the UK and I'm sure Professor ben Bindra uses it in uh, Australia as well. Uh, that kind of sums me to the end in terms of ulnar-sided pain. So it is not uncommon that we get ulnar-sided pain and ulnar-sided pain need treatment across uh, ulnar-side. Uh, the pictures show uh, a Darex and a, uh, a Savika Panji, but that does not mean that is the only option we have for ulnar-sided pain. So ulnar-sided pains are largely uh, ulnar abutment uh, symptoms. Uh, they occur because of loss of variance, uh, either TFCC tears, or post-traumatic uh, distal radio ulnar joint arthritis. So I think each one requires its own merit rather than just uh, hanging our hats on uh, Suve Kapanji or ulnar head ray resection. Um, so coming to the end in, in summary, I'd probably say uh, that malunion remains most common complication and uh, non-operative treatment of uh, the unstable extra articular fracture uh, is the most commonest cause of uh, this malunion. Uh, Intra-articular malunion most commonly results from uh, failure of recognizing potential unstable fractures or insufficient reduction. Osteotomy can improve function, appearance, carpal kinematics, definitely uh, for extra-articular uh, malunion, but also for intra-articular malunions. But uh, early corrections are important for intra-articular. We, I don't think we should wait too long because if we can prevent onset of cartilage damage, that is good for the patient. In all this, the, the key point really is 
complication and failures are common hence prevention is better than cure so if we can prevent our uh, malunions by good reductions and by good alignments then there is uh, no better treatment than this uh, good results generally is achieved by careful selection and surgical technique because it is very easy to try and uh, uh, repair or try and uh, correct something that should not have been corrected that should have been salvaged at the same time uh, it is very easy to miss something that needs correction and wait uh, because we know we can salvage it at a later date uh, so every every wrist or every malunion has to be in its own merit thank you gautam uh, i'm i'm sure there will be good amount of discussion on this in any anybody wants to uh, open up the discussion uh, gautam you can stop sharing your screen okay. so that we can okay. have everybody on board correct so okay can i ask a question yeah please satish go ahead so uh, gautam uh, the two cases of extra articular mal united radius which you showed Yes. One dorsally and one volarly, uh, which you have plated. Yes. Uh, to my eyes, it appeared that the inferior radioulnar joint doesn't seem very congruent or reduced. What's your take on that? Does, Give me a second. Does that Give contribute still to the pain or? So you're talking about this one? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Maybe. So so it. So there is no. no right or wrong answer to it the patient okay. has a restricted range of movement okay the the pronosupination range of movement has always been but sometimes you can't get it corrected to the same length it is just not possible so subjecting patients to two operations so i mean yes you right the the, the distal radial ulnar joint does not appear very congruent however i'm not sure if this is going to give a problem because if you see a lot of conservative cases this is a common picture that you get a neutral wrist with a slight reduction in the uh, radial height uh, they work absolutely fine if they do have a problem yes ulnar shortening osteotomy is advised but it is it is step wise because we we really don't know how much of uh, things get contributed to what in terms of uh, radiological versus patient symptoms so there is no point in adding one procedure at the same time no so the only the only point time when you actually should think about osteotomy of the ulna in my is if you're looking at closing wedge osteotomies because if you're looking at closing wedge osteotomies then you're going to lose height by the nature of the osteotomy in which case uh, you are really asking for problems uh uh gautam i i have a slightly different take on this so uh, in fact uh, the the parameter which uh which is known to have maximum impact on symptoms of a malunited distal radius is the height correct that's one thing which is considered uh, uh, that we, we need to we need to restore the radius ulna relative height to its normal even though we are not able to restore the absolute height so i, I tend to be very aggressive in terms of uh, the variance that i want to get if i have a uh Uh, so so pankaj yes, yes. if 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 in your aggression yes uh, you if you're creating a gap between the radius and the uh, between the at the osteotomy site yes and you losing uh, cortical contact uh huh provided you're going volar is what i'm assuming yes uh, uh, then uh, you have a higher risk of uh, complications so that is what literature says yeah so 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 if if i am not too aggressive about the trapezoid graft i i depend on osteotomy to give me the angular correction correct and i am very aggressive with my ulna shortening in okay. the same thing so i uh, it it's not easy to gain the radial length unless you have a circumferential soft tissue release uh, which which i am not too keen on uh, because i, I that that would also delay the healing and, and perhaps necessitate bone grafting 
but i'm unhappy to see uh, alna which is uh, you know kissing the lunet and okay. i'm i'm really worried whether uh, the symptoms will go away uh, also uh, uh, it it is it would be quite useful to see the in- Uh, Say again, sorry. The, the 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 anatomy of the DRU is the inclination of the of the sigmoid notch to decide uh, whether you want to accept a certain malalignment in the distal radial ulnar joint. So uh, if if it is a flat vertical uh, DRU uh, sigmoid notch, correct. Then perhaps some amount of limb discrepancy may be better tolerated at the DRU level. Not sure whether it will be. Uh, tol- uh, tolerated well at the alno carpal level. Uh, that that's my take on this. However, the question that still uh, uh, my answer to is: Are we able to predict which malunions are going to be symptomatic and which malunions will not be symptomatic? I don't uh, think we can. Uh, it, yeah, not- one of the one of the parameters very frequently have been used is a. is age uh, plus 65 plus they would be tolerated well and 65 minus they may not be tolerated well so your take on it and uh, perhaps dr bindra who could give a expert comment on that post your comment so so pankaj I, i am not sure i think inherently we are a little on the back foot when it comes to operating uh, above 65 the the bones are osteopenic the uh, ala- the aggression required at that time is high and you are not very confident of the fixation because you don't know if that that's going to help that is probably the reason why we tend to not treat say okay thoda symptoms hai it's a, it's a small amount of symptoms we might be able to just accept whereas we are a little aggressive when it comes to people who are between 18 to 65 so that's i think it's it's a surgeon bias rather than a patient uh, related bias uh because symptoms are symptoms you get in 65 year old active patients as well and you get it in 25 year old active patients as well so i think it's a, it's a surgical bias is what i feel uh, that's that's my uh uh plus also how many you do so if you're doing this say once every month or once every few weeks you obviously obviously going to be more aggressive than than age is just a number I, I agree with you gautam i mean uh, uh, you, you, the uh, different surgeons will look at age parameter very differently uh, dr bindra you have any comments on this please uh, i think uh, you know very good uh, presentation gautam i think uh, one of the points pankaj made i totally agree with that if the ulna is still long they won't be satisfied and uh, there's two ways to deal with it one is to keep jacking the radius open and i use a push pull screw so i put a screw outside the plate on the proximal edge of the radius and use a lamina spreader and you slowly distract over about 10 or 15 minutes but i too have broken a radius at the shaft by doing that because when they are osteoporotic and you're doing a malunion correction you have to be prepared for having complications so when i do need to get back height i will put in iliac bone graft i'll take some iliac bone graft and some allograft and mix the two and put it in so i'm 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 i would do everything to get the ulna height back to neutral the other option is to shorten the ulna uh, and uh, you know because we have these ulna shortening specific plates shortening of the ulna is a much quicker procedure now yes so when i'm looking at someone who's got a mal union firstly i wait for a year uh, because a lot of people adjust to it and even though the ulna looks long they seem to accommodate it number one if they still have pain after a year Uh, i would look at see whether just an ulna shortening will do the trick so if the angulation of the radius is not severe it's only about 5 degrees in all directions and the main problem is ulnar carpal impaction my preferred option for uh, radius malunion is actually ulnar shortening and then if i do do a radius correction then i certainly correct it till i've got it right uh, otherwise i feel they've been put through an operation without any benefit but but if i'm getting them uh, length back i i do use uh, iliac bone graft so that i can get it right and make it heal i've got to run now so but uh, thank you very much pankaj for having me and thanks so, everyone uh, so 
yeah i think thank it was you, wonderful Dr. to Bindra. have you here professor Yorka, uh, i yeah. must thank you very much uh, you, we thought that you would be there only for another half an hour or so but you sat right through and gave encouragement to your youngsters i think that speaks great about the love and dedication that you have for the hand surgery and for indians especially mumbai i and thank you very much for coming and enlightening us also encouraging the youngsters and that is what we wanted uh, thanks a lot for staying here with us for almost 3 hours and more maybe and we'll call you again uh, so of course we'll with pleasure in, uh, coming again and again and again uh, yeah. to to give this kind of encouragement in future too Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Dr. Bindra. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Bindra. Thank you very much. Yeah. Enjoy yeah. your Sunday. Uh, Bye. I, yeah. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pankaj Ahire for setting up such a beautiful academic uh, program to all the speakers for pleasure. bringing out such pertinent topics and very crisp. presented and the answers also replied to the point it was really a learning session for all of us and more than 1000 viewers who were stuck to us who were viewing us on youtube and other channels it was a really nice experience we must thank ashok shah neeraj bidlani of ortho tv who have allowed us to use their platform which has increased our outreach many fold many many people across the country have joined us and uh, last of all our president dr ram prabhu whose brain child this program was and who has worked hard and given us given us all the support required to set up this program i would request dr ram prabhu to come in and uh, say a few words yeah uh, thank you very much dr mutha first of all i thank professor randy bindra who came all the way from australia and encouraged our youngsters the whole idea of msos having this and the concept was dr mutha's concept and i thought that it was a wonderful idea to have the youngsters uh, take over the functions of many and the lectures etc so now the baton has been shifted from professor bb joshi to dr lard to dr gavande and then to of course our own sudhir warrior and heman patankar and and um, pankaj jindal and now we have the whole lot of generation of hand surgeons who are there mm -hmm. have really done a great job today and i must thank each and every one who have contributed today for this um, wonderful uh, webinar i must thank to start with uh, uh, dr gangude who spoke wonderfully well dr milin suraude dr rohan habbu dr uh, gautam tawri Uh, and of course the great moderation by pankaj aire and satish mutha i think this is really a wonderful program and i must thank ashok chan okay, and viraj who have got into this uh, and ortho tv so that all the reach has really increased to almost 1000 that's what i hear i think this is a great opportunity for youngsters to showcase their talent their to their work also and this is a platform which could be used very well by all these youngsters who have done a great job Uh, on these talks i have really enjoyed i thought that i would be here for 5 minutes in the beginning and the end but i sat through it because i really enjoyed i learned a lot from these youngsters and also from the moderation of pankaj ahire i have got a great regards for pankaj and pankaj uh, you must uh, mentor these youngsters uh, pankaj you paresh lad and all these hand surgeons should mentor these youngsters and i am sure bombay will again shine all across india in a great hand surgery a uh, place where people come here for fellowship thank you very much again uh, the ortho tv all the participants the moderation and satish keep it up uh, i think uh, we should have this every sunday and i think yeah, we can you, soon have this for 52 weekend yeah let's hope so, so all the best you. for the thank next you. sunday and i think he has got yeah. a great program lined up on uh, thr satish yeah so i think yeah. we we'll look forward to that also and after that thank you so let's have a great thank time you. on sunday thank you very thank you sir thank you for your thank encouragement thank you ashok sir. ashok can you put your video on for a second we must, we must thank our uh, sponsors wisera who is got yeah. it together so i i cannot forget their contribution to having this webinars too wisera so thank you everybody ramnath bhai for giving a platform 
Thank you, thank you. Thank you, uh, Sujara. Team uh, Sujara will be with us. Thank you, thank you very much, sir. Yeah, Ashok, Ashok, can, can we can we can, can we stop 